James II, who ruled Scotland for 23 years between 1437 and 1460. His reign is generally looked upon favorably, such as the foundations of the University of Glasgow made him a popular king, but he was also responsible for reprehensible acts like the killings of Earl Douglas. In fact, James showed that he was willing to get rid of anyone who threatened his rule. Even though the Scottish War of Independence was over just by 15th century, certain areas around the border regions remained under British control. One of them was the Ruxburg Castle, as King James thought that he would be able to get to reclaim the castle for Scotland at a time when English forces were weakened by the War of Roses. But while he was waltzing in, trying to find his way through, making his way downtown, walking fast, faces past, and he was homebound, or more or less cannon bound, he died. He was killed by a cannon, and not just any cannon, his own. He was just standing right next to one when, instead of shooting it, it just exploded. And honestly, you could say he had a blast. Charles VIII, a 15 year reign as King of France between 1483 and 1498. Since he was only 13 years old, uh, you know, which was pretty still inexperienced and a child after all, why would you give a 13 year old the responsibility to rule an entire nation? So this young baby boy was off to do the civil duties of a king, except no, he was literally just a prepubescent adolescent who just wanted to play Fortnite and learn how to make NFTs. To strengthen his position, he made numerous concessions to the various monarchies surrounding his kingdom, which did help improve the relationship between France and the Italian regions. But then one day, while he was trying to actually withhold some responsibilities, he decided to hang out and play a game of tennis. Now, tennis is a pretty old game in itself, and it's actually often played by the royals in France. Except this game was proven fatal when he just walked into a low doorway and stuck his head against the door. Yes, that's how he died. He wasn't playing tennis, nor did he get hit by a tennis ball. He was on his way to a game when he smacked his head against the door, and then falling into a coma, and then dying a few hours later. Later. For Charles VIII, that's sad to say that he didn't see it coming. As for Cece, also known as Elizabeth, she was able to at least enjoy the longest reign in Austrian history. As the wife of Emperor Franz Joseph I, Elizabeth held the position of Empress of Austria and Queen of Hungary for 44 years. Unfortunately, in a wrong place, wrong time situation, she was assassinated. By his own admission, Luigi Luceni had nothing against Elizabeth personally. The Italian anarchist simply despised all royalty and wealthy people in general. He was the kind of guy that would say, not tax rich, but eat them. His intended target was Prince Philip, Duke of Orleans, but unfortunately for everyone involved, except the Duke, Luciani arrived too late in Geneva and he missed the opportunity, so he grabbed the newspaper, looked for the next biggest target in town, who happened to be Elizabeth. He found out where she was staying, went to the hotel, and waited for her. When Elizabeth came out, Luciani approached her and stabbed her in the heart. He then gave himself up, quite proud of his actions. In fact, he asked to be extradited to Italy and received a public execution worthy of a martyr. And the government, of course, was not quick to do him any favors, denied his request, and so he just hung himself in his cell. King Alexander of Greece in the 20th century only lived up to rule about three years. At the age of 27, he was out and about walking his dog. He lived in a palace, by the way, that had a lot of animals from different origins and backgrounds, species and whatnot. So anyways, he was walking his dog, minding his own business, and his dog started fighting with one of his pet monkeys that they had on site. And so Alexander, like a good pet monkey dog owner, does what, you know, one does, which is to try to break the fight. So what happens? The monkey went a wild and bit him. Although the monkey was groomed and cared for, and still died also for harming the king, the king had politely asked everyone to like, yo, just don't bring up the fact that I got bitten by a monkey. However, uh, because he took the monkey bite at the same time as any other bite, the wound wasn't properly cleaned up and it got infected. He ended up getting infected so much that it was infecting really badly the same day that he got bit. And eventually he was so bedridden that it, it resulted to severe sepsis. In all honesty, the medical team back then was wasn't that great as his life could have been saved if they just had amputated his leg, but who knew or what was the cause with the antibiotics or something. They didn't have any of that stuff. But still, he died after three weeks fighting for his life against his pet monkey bite. You don't bite the hand that feeds you, sometimes you just die from sepsis. Living in the 18th century, King Yongjo of Joseon was actually one of the most successful and long-lived rulers in Korean history. He reigned for 52 years, which he implemented a new taxation system trying to minimize fighting between factions by adopting a Confucian mentality. However, he's mostly remembered by many today for his execution of his son. Young Jio could not allow his son Sado to rule after him. The man was absolutely deeply unstable and prone to violent outbursts. Apparently he was a real menace, like a real psycho. It stressed the king so much that in order to get rid of his son according to the law, you could only dispose your son with the consent of the mother. And so the mom was like, yeah, my son freaking sucks, get rid of him. So the king ordered his son to be locked inside of a heavy chest used for storing rice, and after 8 days, they found the son suffocated in rice. 
choice. And talking of unpleasant sights, Isabelline Brown is number seven on the list. Victorian orsonologists, that's a fancy name for bird science people, are some of the only fun sciencey folks out there. They like to use obscure adjectives when naming newfound species, especially those that are a predominant color. As a result, there are species whose names include such words as Cerceline, which is sky blue, Cenarius, which is ashy, and Citrine, a light olive for some examples. But my favorite avian hue is Isabelline. Why? Because of its off-color origins, that's why. So prepare to ratch. Isabella and her husband, Albert IV, Archduke of Austria, were the southern of the Spanish Netherlands from 1598 to 1621. British folklore goes that in 1601, a Spanish army led by Albert laid siege to Austin on behalf of her half-brother, King Philip III of Spain. Isabella apparently was feeling very, very confident in her husband's ability to win, so confident she vowed not to change her underwear until the city was taken. Unfortunately for Isabella and her entourage, her husband was not a great military tactician and the siege lasted until 1604, so three years. And for those three years, Isabella supposedly wore the same grubby underwear until they developed a range of unsavory coloration. Now if you're currently retching, I'm sorry, but I'm not letting up. Isabella as a color description was used before the siege in the year 1600, the inventory of Queen Elizabeth the first wardrobe. So if the color Isabelline predates the siege of Austin, then the expression must come from an earlier Isabella. The French, German, Italian, and Spanish languages all have versions of the word with a similar folk entomology, except that in all cases, the reference is to the eight-month siege of Granada by Isabella the first of Castile and her husband Ferdinand the second of Aragon. So if any royal Isabella did give their underoos the world's worst tie-dye job, then well, it seems likely it was Isabella of Castile. So let's talk about Isabella of Castile for number six and her bathing ban, shall we? So Philip II, Isabella's father, banned bathhouses in 1576. So apparently it's in the genetics to be downright filthy. This may sound crazy, but in Spain, the Christian doctrine saw bathing as a corrupt practice that could only lead to nakedness. Apparently being a human in your most natural form was considered hedonism and something unreligious. God forbid if you splash some water on you too. So this belief was to such a wild extent, Christians often walked from England or France to Jerusalem as a ritual without washing or changing their clothes. After the conquest of Granada by the Christians, the Muslims of Spain not only had to give up their religion to survive the Inquisition, but they also had to give up bathing. Isabella and Ferdinand ordered the Muslim baths to be destroyed and informed them that bathing was strictly forbidden. Isabella boasted that she herself, their leader, had only bathed twice in her life, and pretty much every historian takes her word for it. Makes sense that she would be so grimy they can name a questionable shade of brown after her underwear. Naturally, the Muslim people are absolutely horrified because cleanliness is literally mandatory in their religion as the prerequisite for every form and mode of worship. And by extension, it had become culturally significant. To separate them from their religion and then ban their last remaining tie to it, that's dirtier than Isabella's briefs. Even when Columbus mentioned the daily bathing habits of the indigenous peoples of Bahamas and the Caribbean, Isabella was horrified to the point of rage and commanded them too as her new subjects to stop this blasphemous bathing practice at once. Yeah, so number five is the highly debated blood baths. Oh, you thought Kim Kardashian invented the vampire facial? Girl, please. The culture vulture ain't got nothing on this. So, enter Elizabeth Bathory, who was either genuinely a menacing sociopathic killer or a pawn incriminated by family. If she was the first one, then you could definitely count her fave beauty hack as uncommon. So, Bathory is often proclaimed as the most prolific female killer of all time, accused of more than 600 plus young women's deaths inside her lavish castle. According to legend, she believed bathing in virginal blood would grant her eternal youth. And according to witnesses, if you want to believe a bunch of biased people after her money, Bathory's crimes took place between 1590 and 1610, with the most vicious happening after her husband's death in 1604. And it would take the blood of three maidens to fill Bathory's clawfoot porcelain tub. She would also use the blood as lip tint and rouge. And Bathory's alleged crimes have inspired films, plays, operas, television, shows and even video games. And you may be wondering, what is that exotic scent? Well, it's number four, dead cat musk. Henry VIII had some fun and fabulous hygiene habits. He invented groom of the stool, didn't bathe often, and when he did, it was in an old and aged version of a wooden jacuzzi tub. And he always had someone else wash his undercarriage. Sometimes while taking these baths to ease the pain in his sore leg, Henry soaked a mixture of herbs, musk, and civet. What is civet? 
Well, the segment's name should probably imply it. It's a dead cat. It's a fancy kind of dead cat to be particular because it's small, wild, and carnivorous with a super distinct smell. I am not sure what cat musk smells like, but if it's anything like the smell of their spray, I am more than okay with not knowing. Like many people of his day, Henry also went to bed in a piece of fur so that fleas and lice would jump on it and not his royal skin. Which begs the question, wouldn't the fleas be confused if you smelled like a dead cat? Banned from drinking it, but love to bathe in it. Number three is Mary Queen of Wine. Get it? Because she's usually called Mary Queen of Scots, and Scots sounds like scotch. Went too far with it. That's okay. Anyway, so apparently Mary Queen of Scots wouldn't bathe in mere water, but in sweet white wine, as she believed it to be good for her complexion. She wouldn't touch a drop of the drink, being staunchly religious, but she still kept wine stores just to have poured in her bathtub, believing it to make her look pale and beautiful. Also, Mary equipped this as a form of pain relief. With venotherapy, including wine massages, facials, and baths were made popular today, this shouldn't actually come as a surprise, especially because wine baths can be traced back to the times of Greece and Rome. There's even a very famous 16th century recipe called Afar Bella Fascia, which translates to, to make a beautiful face. And it has a recipe to create a cosmic brew by boiling rosemary flowers with white wine. Quite a few people have tried it, as you can find the recipe online, and one tester group was called the Beautiful Chemistry Project, which studies its effects on skin quality and discovered that the process released essential oils and chemicals chemicals with antibacterial, moisture binding, collagen growth stimulating, anti-inflammatory, antioxidant, brightening and soothing effects. Number two is the stuff of nightmare, it's the permed wig. This really came as a shocker and is quite weird. So when King Charles II had intercourse with ladies, he would collect some of their down their hair and then he would stitch it into a wig, which he donated to a club for rich nobles, I don't know, to like look at it, and then it was stolen from that club where someone starts another club where people came just to kiss the, the wig thing. Anyway, so King George IV was so inspired by this, he started doing the same. But unfortunately, he failed to complete his down there hair wig because he died before he finished collecting enough hair. Yeah, moving on. And last but not least, number one, ohagoro. So the Japanese custom of blackening one's teeth is an ancient practice, whether in the famous Genji Monogatari, a book from the 12th century that is considered the world's very first novel, or in various fairy and folk tales. The art of blackening one's teeth held a prominent place in Japan's history for some time. One of the main reasons for ohagoro is the fact that for hundreds of years, pitch black objects were regarded with immense beauty. It's only natural that people want to get closer to to what they deem as beautiful, just like the process of having one's teeth bleached to appear more white in modern times. So using a solution called Kenimizu, made out of ferric acetate from iron fillings mixed with vinegar and tannin from vegetables or tea, the custom was first used to celebrate someone's coming of age. Around the end of the Heian period, teeth blackening was done by adult aristocrats and nobles regardless of gender on a daily basis. By the time we hit the Edo period in 1603, teeth blackening is a sign of nobility and aristocracy is exclusively, especially amongst wealthy married women trying to mimic the allure of a geisha. Even now when walking the streets of Kyoto, Japan's old capital, it's not uncommon to meet a mako with pitch black teeth. As you might know, during the end of the Edo period and the beginning of the Meiji period, Japan was visited by western foreigners after almost 200 years of seclusion. Being used to western beauty standards, many visitors were shocked to see women with black teeth walking around. Some even thought that the Japanese people had terrible mouth hygiene, mistaking the dye for actual tooth rot, and then others, having realized the blackening was on purpose, wondered why Japanese women would disfigure themselves. Okay. So Ohagoro was banned by the Meiji government in 1870 to appeal to western opinions, and the art of dyeing one's teeth was almost forgotten. Today it can be seen in theaters, movies, and the aforementioned Kyoto, where Geisha and Maiko still roam the street. Like Edmund II of England, oh to be stabbed in thy buttocks while you rest your thighs upon the latrine, is what happened to the king, and after his father's death in April. 1016, Edmund was chosen as king of England by the small number of council members. The Danish invasion was around the corner and they had spies everywhere. The leader of the Danish invasion had a son who wanted to do his papa proud, so he snuck into the castle and for some reason hid in the toilet of King Edmund. He waited till the king walked in and sat where he would sit for the very last time. With a very long knife, he struck and died. After two strikes, the son escaped and although there are different accounts to this tale of it being just an assassin, or maybe if it was the actual son who did this, either way, the Danish invasion didn't like it as this was a horrible way to die. So I don't know, what do you think? Is, would you check the pit before you sit? <laughs> Sorry.
Anyways, personally, I hate this one because it's just so gross. Because, you know, speaking of toilets, it did happen to him as Duke Jing ruled the state of Jin in the ancient China between 599 to 581 BC and died shortly after his abdication due to illness. According to the ancient Chinese text to the Zhu Zong, Jing consulted a shaman after being visited by a demonic entity in a nightmare. The shaman told me that he would not live to taste the new wheat, so Jin struggled on, and what the wheat was ready to be eaten, he had the shaman killed for making an incorrect prediction. Either just before he tucked into his tasty wheat or just after, he suddenly felt the need to go to the toilet. It is unknown why, but Jing fell in and decided not decided, it wasn't his choice. It is unknown why, but Jing fell in and ended up drowning in the pit of urine and feces. Drowning in anything is a bad way to go, but drowning in excrement is horrifying. The servant who fished his body out of the latrine also suffered a horrible death as they were both buried alive together with Jing. Ugh. Lampreys is a nasty looking eel, and for some reason, while visiting family and hunting, King Henry I of England wanted to eat a whole hearty meal of lampreys. Although Henry was fond of the fish, his doctor advised him to go avoid them because, according to historian Henry of Huntington, that they always disagreed with him. Henry ignored his physician and chowed down on the forbidden fish, and soon after, it caused a sudden and extreme disturbance under which his aged frame sunk into a deathly toper. Henry is not the only king to have eaten himself to death, as Adolf Frederick of Sweden managed it in. In 1771, after eating a copious amount of seafood, then tucking into a Samilla bun, then one after the other and the other and the other, in total eating up to 14 sweet buns before experiencing his own stomach imploding and dying. Al Musal Simbala is the last Absasid Caliph to rule from Baghdad and was killed by Hulagu Khan, Genghis Khan's grandson. There are different stories about exactly how he was executed, but it's generally accepted that there's no blood that was shed. The most popular accounts are the fact that he rolled up into a rug and trampled to death by horses or locked into a treasure room to starve to death. In the travels of Marco Polo in 1300, it is written that Hulagu told the Caliph to eat of thy treasure as much as thou will, and since thou art so found of it, he shall never ever ever again have anything else to eat. Historian Nasima Nagaz uh, states that trampling is now regarded as the most likely cause of death, as she comments that while this is technically a noble death, there was no blood that was spilt. It was probably because they had less nothing to do of honoring him because of his royal blood, and more of the fact that Mongols' religious beliefs and superstitions, as Mongols believed that the soul resided in the person's blood. So a bloody death meant their soul was free to take revenge, and plus, breaking a person's bone was believed to be ensured that their lineage would be ended. Number 7. Devi, the Maharanis of Kuch Bihar Indira Devi was the daughter of the Maharaja of Baroda and his second wife was the Maharani. Well, she was betrothed herself to a Maharaja of a different region, Gwalir. However, when she was still young, she met and fell in love with another man who was himself the younger brother to the Maharaja of Kuch Bihar. If this wasn't scandalous enough, Indira refused to give up on her love and even chose to boldly break off her own engagement by sending a letter to her fiance saying that she did not wish to marry him. She did this without consulting her parents and despite them attempting to dissuade her from marrying her love, she basically they did so anyway, with them basically accepting her marriage but refusing to be a part of it at all. So she kind of got like disowned, but like not officially disowned. Through her husband Jitendra, she would become the Maharani of Kuch Bihar, when shortly after their wedding his elder brother died. While their life together was seemingly happy, they quickly had five children together, her husband would die less than 10 years later, leaving her widowed with five children and making her the regent of Kuch Bihar in his absence with her eldest son poised to inherit the position of ruler when he came of age. Now she was not seen as being a very good ruler and often preferred to gallivant through Europe with a passion for fashion, specifically Italian designer shoes, of which she had many, some of which were even diamond encrusted. Though I can't imagine taking all of that on would be easy, honestly. Not to write her off, but just saying. Sounds like she also had like kind of a crazy life. Number six, Singh, the Maharajas of Jaipur. Maharaja Madho Singh II was questionable when it came to how he spent his money. At one point, he used his immense wealth as the Maharaja of Jaipur to order two giant silver boats to be made. Around 14,000 silver coins were melted down so that his wish could be granted. Now, why did he need this? Be well, because he wanted to carry with him on his trip to Britain a ton of Ganga Jal, which is basically holy water, I believe, or just water, perhaps. He just really loved water, I guess. I mean, I can understand if it's holy water, it being somewhat religious, but it sounds honestly like a lot of holy water if you got to make two giant silver boats. And why exactly did he need to transport it via silver? Like, that's unnecessarily lavish. Number five, Sindhya, the Maharajas of Gwalior. 
This one actually connects to an earlier story I told of a different family. Remember Indira Devi? This is the man that she was actually going to marry, but uh, she didn't. Maharaja Sir Madho Rao Sindhya of Gwalior is an interesting man who seemed very worldly, but like most royals out there, even he had his eccentricities. At one point, he apparently had a model train set made entirely out of silver, which he then used to deliver food and drink around his dinner table. Honestly, I feel like this one is actually like one of the lesser vices on our list here. It actually kind of sounds cool, to be honest. However, like all royals, even his family's claim was abolished following the partition. So whether or not it was cool doesn't really matter anymore. Number four, Kanji, the Nawabs of Junagar. The Nawab of Junagar is an interesting one, specifically the ruling of Muhammad Mahabet Khan III Kanji, known as the last Nawab of Junagar. Muhammad apparently loved his dogs, so much so that it was believed at one point he owned up to 2,000 of them. That's a lot of dogs. While his people struggled living in squalor and poverty, he did things like throw lavish parties for his dogs. Each dog was supposedly given their own room, their own servant, and their own phone. Although I don't know how a dog uses a phone. I guess they just like knock it off the hook and then they just like bark into it. I don't know. Can't imagine they would be able to dial anything, but you know, maybe he also had all of his dogs trained to use the phone. <laughs> I don't know. At one point, the last Nawab ended up throwing a lavish wedding for his favorite dog, Roshanara, when he ascertained that she had fallen in love with another dog who was named Bobby. He even invited the Viceroy of India at the time, Lord Irwin, to attend, but of course the Viceroy politely declined the invitation because, yeah, that would be a weird thing to attend and also probably doesn't look good on you to go to lavish dog weddings. Number 3, Devi the Maharanis of Baroda. Princess Sita Devi was once known as the Maharani or Queen of Baroda. But after a time, even her right to rule was pretty much erased. In fact, while she grew up in India and was the queen of Baroda, she died in Paris, France. During her time as Maharani, she became responsible for many treasures and apparently had an affinity and a love of pearl carpets, of which the Baroda treasury actually had quite a few. I didn't even know pearl carpets were a thing, but apparently they are. A pearl carpet, while luxurious, certainly sounds like it wouldn't be that comfortable, honestly. And while pearls are strong, I would be worried about damaging them by walking all over them. But that's what you do with these carpets. I mean, I don't know, maybe you just like put them out and you just like look at them. And you're like, look at that. Look how pretty that is. Don't step on that, just look at it. Number two, Khan, the Nazims of Hyderabad. Literally, this family was pretty much erased when you think of what happened to them after India gained independence, with their wealth literally being seized by the government. Mir Osman Ali Khan was the last Nazim of the region known as Hyderabad. During his lifetime, he was also considered to be the wealthiest man in the world, according to the Guinness Book of World Records. Khan's family owned the Golconda Mines, thanks to their royal claim, which at the time was the only place, the singular place, supplying diamonds to the world at large. The Nazim's wealth was so, so great that he apparently used one of the world's largest diamonds, the fifth biggest diamond in the world, known as the Jacob Diamond, which weighed around 145 carat as his paperweight. You know you're on another level when that's what you use as a paperweight. Number one, Williat, the Queens of Oud. This one is quite unsettling in the sense that it was never actually, but for more than 30 years, people believe that this woman, Begum Williat, had actually been the Queen of Oud displaced by the partition. However, only a few years ago, we learned that this was all a lie, thanks to the reporting of New York Times journalist Ellen Berry. Berry befriended the younger son of the family, and during the course of her investigation digging into who these people were before chaos ensued, learned that though Begum Williat had fervently claimed to be royalty and demanded what was rightfully hers to be returned until she took her own life in the 1990s, the truth was she and her family had apparently never been royalty. Throughout her investigation, Ellen Berry learned that before the partition, Begum had been the widow of civil servant Inayatula Butts and had been admitted to a mental hospital after he passed away. She would then go on to claim that she was the Queen of Oud and demand back what she said was rightfully hers. Her family was given a dilapidated palace to squat in squalor until all of them each died. 
only being survived by her eldest son, who had actually run away to London years ago and died in 2019, a few years after the rest of his family. It was also revealed that he'd actually been sending money home to his family in India to help them survive this whole time. What isn't clear is how much of it was truly believed and how much of it was an intentional scam. I don't know if we even know that today. In slavery, Cleopatra, the last active ruler of the Plutomatic Kingdom of Egypt, is not particularly associated with the direct role in the institution of slavery during her reign. However, the benefits she had gained during the socio-economic conditions of ancient Egypt were pushed when the financial strain began into weighing in her later years. By Cleopatra's time, Egypt had become a Roman client state, and Cleopatra herself was involved in political alliances and relationship with prominent Romans in including Julius Caesar and Mark Antony. The Roman world was heavily dependent on slave labor and the economy of Rome and its territories were supported by a significant slave population. The wealth and prosperity of Cleopatra's Egypt were by in some extent sustained by the labor of both free and enslaved individuals. When she exhausted her financials for civil war, which we will later break down in this video, it was also exhausting the people around her including those in the lower positions. Her popularity dwindled in all social classes and her status had not had become more damage when it was clear she was not suited for military tactics. Number 9. Bad Rep Although in Egypt at the height of her reign she was seen as an ethereal being with charisma scaled to 100, she had also been seen as untrustworthy to the Romans and any foreign queen who somehow sprinkled sprinkled their way into your top military general and rulers would probably be worrisome to the people of Rome. Considering Rome was one of the most abundant and vibrant civilizations that ruled with an iron fist as it colonized its way through Eurasia and, and Africa, when it came to foreign leaders it was always an extreme dissonance to their influence. Even when Germanic tribes had peaceful moments with the Romans, they were able to trade in good and culture but either way the Romans held them at an arm's length. But with Cleopatra, she was straight within the better morning, noon and night. Cleopatra's relationship with Caesar and Antony were sources of criticism and oppositions from political rivals, especially those who supported the sanctorial faction in Rome. The idea of a foreign queen exercising the influence over Roman leaders was politi uh, politically sensitive and Cleopatra was often depicted negatively in the Propaganda of her enemies. The Roman people did not know what to make of her. They were horrified at the idea of having an Egyptian queen, but they were fascinated by her themselves. As soon as everything unfolded in regards to Julius Caesar and Mark Antony, Augustus was able to regain and exploit the association and knock the rulers back to Rome's hand. In summary, they felt either way, despite her conflicting popularity, she would have not lasted in Rome. Number 8 A broke kingdom in quotations. Her connection with Rome did bring forth a lot of influence to her politically as a ruler in Egypt as she was able to reign more power and economy to Egypt. She built up Egypt's economy and even expanded Egypt's trade routes to eastern nations. This allowed them to not be dependent solely on Rome and Cleopatra's work did give Egypt its economic stability. After all, her net worth as a woman in history was estimated to be 95 billion dollars. She was banking, but how did this woman who had so much money still be militarily poor? Well, her spendings. She was able to to spend $500,000 alone, which back then was around 10 million sesquitries or sesquitries, I don't know how they say it, on just dinner just to show off to Mark Antony how much he had. In our number 7 spot today, we have King Charles the First. Okay, this is one that goes way back and it really creeps me out. So King Charles the First, right now we're on the third, so we're taking it a couple back. King Charles I was tried for treason after the Civil War and he ended up being beheaded in 1649. I guess in the 1600s everyone was beheaded so this wasn't necessarily abnormal which is certainly weird but that's a history lesson for another day. The weird part of this however is that apparently his head was sewn back on his body so that he could sit for a portrait or it was perhaps supposed to be a sign of respect. Either way it's very weird and very gross. I feel terrible for whoever's job it was to do that and I also feel bad for the artist who was forced to paint that. Talk about traumatic. It does certainly make sense though that people say that Charles Ghost still haunts a building because there is no amount of haunting that could make up for being beheaded and then having your head sewn back onto your body. Okay, why'd we do the first part if we were gonna do the second? Could have just cut the middle man, you know? But instead, they cut his head off, okay? <laughs> in our number six spot today, we have never travel in pairs. 
This is one travel rule that certainly makes sense, but it is really dark when you think about it. This rule is one that the British royal family, and honestly many people who can afford this sort of luxury safety do nowadays. This tradition and rule is one that means that any heirs to the throne are not allowed to travel together. This is of course in case some sort of accident happens, not every heir to the throne would be injured or perhaps killed. It's definitely very smart and sensible, but it has got to be grim, just constantly preparing for the worst thing to happen. It is of the utmost importance to the royal family that they preserve the line to the throne. Like I mentioned before, however, other people are now taking a page out of the royal book and are using this travel rule where possible. In our number 5 spot today, we have the black outfit. Another travel rule that the royal family must follow is in regards to an item that they have to bring with them on all trips, whether business or pleasure. It is pretty unusual to see the royal family dressed in black, despite what a specific occasion calls for it, but every time they travel, they are required to bring an all black outfit with them. This is to prepare for the worst case scenario. If they are away on a trip and somebody important to them passes away, they need to ensure that they are ready with the appropriate clothing for when they are able to touch down on their home soil. This is of course very practical, but it's definitely kind of morbid. I mean, you're having to fuss over what you're going to wear when you're actually just mourning the loss of someone close to you. It certainly wouldn't be the top of my list of things to focus on, but maybe that's why I'm not cut out for royalty. Okay. In our number four spot today, we have the rules of the road. Okay. This like rule or tradition or law I guess is probably one of the craziest things I've ever heard, but I guess it's been around for quite a while and I just had no idea. As it turns out, the monarch is the only person in the UK who is allowed to drive without a legal license or even license plates. Like. That's insane. I didn't expect the king to have to take a driver's test like everyone else, but just having a rule that allows them, if they chose to, to drive without any idea how? It's pretty bizarre. The good news is though, which makes this rule make a lot more sense, is that of course, rather than driving himself, King Charles' chauffeur will be much more responsible for most of the driving for the king. Let's just hope the chauffeur has their driver's license. I'm not gonna lie, there's this like silly photo of the queen, and every time I think about like the monarch driving without a license, I just think of this like little photo. She's got like a little silly grin on her face. She looks mischievous. And that's what I like to think, her just driving with no license. In our number 3 spot today, we have the armed forces. This is a tradition or system that comes into play when a new monarch comes into power. So last year this happened with the king after the passing of the queen. It is definitely one of the most intimidating parts of his new role, and this is that King Charles now becomes the head of the armed forces. This means that it is his responsibility and he is the only person who can declare when the country is at war and when the war is over. Of course, he won't be doing this entirely alone, he needs to follow the advice and guidance of the government. The perhaps good news is that the new king has held quite close ties to the armed forces throughout his life, even spending time in the Royal Navy and taking flying instruction from the Royal Air Force during his second year at Cambridge University. Of course, the hope is that he won't have to be in a position to make these difficult decisions, but when or if he's faced with them, we can hope he makes the proper decisions for the country. In our number 2 spot today, we have no touching. There is a rule that you just cannot touch a royal. I'm sure there's a multitude of reasons for this, mostly to do with security, but aside from a very lucky handshake, you really are supposed to keep your distance. I suppose it's because I live the life of a regular person, but I kind of feel like in some ways this might be a little sad. I feel like you might be lacking in so much connection with a ton of interesting people, and like some of the people that you meet, wouldn't you just be dying to hug them? You know, apparently this is part of the reason why the queen always wore gloves. She of course shook a lot of hands while making her royal appearances, and the same will likely go for the new king. Maybe he'll take up gloves as a fashion accessory, just like his mother. And finally, in our number one spot today, we have the church. We talked about the armed forces, and King Charles won't only be the head of the armed forces, but he will also become the head of the church in England. Quite a jump from talking about war and being the one who makes those kinds of decisions, to being the head of the church where things hopefully are quite the opposite. This is a post that British monarchs have held since the church was founded by King Henry VIII in the 1500s, and it appears as though the tradition will carry on. In this role, it means that King Charles will be responsible for appointing archbishops and bishops to their role. The king will of course be advised in this role by the prime minister, and it is said that the king is religious in his own right, and that he has already spoken about how his personal faith has informed his approach to leadership. Number 10. 
sing the Maharajas of Patalia. Okay, you have to be kidding me on this one. As unsettling as this story is, I don't think history can actually forget this Maharaja anytime soon because this story is just honestly that wild. So try as we might, I don't know if it'll be possible. Maharaja Sir Bupinder Singh was the ruler of Patalia who sired around 88 children. Yeah. You know the saying, diamonds are a girl's best friend? I feel like this man was actually living that as a motto because he loved jewels and he had a ton of ladies. He was married 10 times and also had a bunch of consorts on top of that. Apparently he loved jewels so much in fact that once a year he would don only a diamond encrusted breastplate and present himself to his subjects. His virility was famous among them, and rather than actually be dismayed at how many women he had in his life and how many children he'd sired, people actually apparently saw it all as like a good omen, believing his manhood even had special powers and would protect them all from evil. I don't know about that, but... <laughs> pretty crazy. And friends, before we move on to our next spot on this list, if you love what we do here at Bumblebee, be sure to let us know by clicking that subscribe button. It helps us out, it feeds the algorithm, it feeds us honey, it's just good for everyone. Number 9, Jala Dynasty, the Maharajas of Wakanar. At one point, the dynasty had the claim to multiple lavish properties. However, unfortunately, after they merged with the government of India, giving up their titles, the homes that had once belonged to their family name became too much for them to manage. One such home was the Wakanar House, which was built in the 1930s in America. The 10,000 square yard property was sold to the US government for $4 million due to the family's lack of ability to pay their taxes on the property. Another massive estate in Bombay was sold off to the Indian government as well for $4.2 million. Number 8. Wadiyar, the Maharajas of Mysore Well, some might say the Wadiyars were attempted to be erased by a curse placed on them by those they had long ago usurped to take control and take the crown for themselves. At least part of this curse, if not all of it, has seemingly been broken at this point. They were cursed to be childless, but the most recently appointed ruler of the royal family actually had a son in 2017 by his wife. However, you could also argue that the Wadi years as rulers have kind of been erased by history as of the 1970s, when the government of India basically stripped the Maharajas of all privileges and titles. Still, the people of the region respect the royal family even today, even if they do technically hold no power officially. So they still, they still kind of are royal. Ludwig was also known as originally as the Mad King, but he didn't didn't really deserve the monk here. He really did was uh, well, he all he really did was ignore politics in favor of the arts. He cared little about ruling. When the kingdom uh, was being subjugated by Prussia, he didn't do anything. In fact, his priority was building incredibly lavish castles where his favorite composers could comp perform. His favorite, especially, he was fond of, of Richard Wagner. Me personally, I like Vivaldi and Midori Goto is my favorite violinist, so I kind of get him. But Ludwig had a thing for money, and like all rulers, he just kept buying. things. Things, properties, buildings to the point where whatever they, you know, the banks kept threatening to take his stuff away, he just ignored them, like the IRS, hoping that they'd go away. He was causing a lot of issues financially for the country and his people and his administration. It wasn't until one day he was taking a walk with his physician, who also declared him as insane. Ludwig just died. In fact, both of them were found dead. The king's death was ruled that he just took his own life, and the official story is stating that he killed the doctor and drowned himself afterwards. However, almost immediately, talks of conspiracies appeared. Of course, modern professionals agree with the initial autopsy, which was rushed and very sloppy. Moreover, several accounts mentioned that the king's coat mysteriously had two bullet holes. The coat was taken from the body and reportedly made several appearances with different owners afterwards. But hey, what do you think happened? Frederick the first, also known as Frederick Barbarossa, was the elected king of Germany in 1152, and later also became the king of Italy before finally being crowned Roman Emperor in 1155. He had a 35-year reign as emperor, most notable in his participation in the Crusades. During the Third Crusade to the Holy Land in 1190, Frederick made his demise as Frederick was leading his German troops into Turkey to face Saladin. The Sultan was already rallying forces from other Muslim leaders in anticipation of the encounter. Frederick would never reach Saladin. He foolishly perished in a river. His army reached the Goksu River in Turkey, and which back then was also known as Salef. His advisors recommended that they find a bridge to cross the turbulent water, but Frederick Nah, he, he felt the river was not that bad and he could cross on horseback. Keen to prove himself right, the king was the first to plunge into the river, but him and his horse could not handle the currents and so the king was not only just not strong enough to swim because he was wearing heavy armor, so both of his horse and himself died. So you could say he was horsing around too much? 
I'm sorry. Frederick was the son of George II and the father of George III. Both his father and his son got to rule the United Kingdom as king, but Frederick never really got the chance because he died before his father. This certainly didn't bother King George II or his wife, who absolutely could not stand their eldest son. Queen Caroline on her deathbed even reported of saying, at least I had one comfort thing in my eyes, which is like, I don't have to see that monster again. Which, you know, damn mom. Anyways, he wasn't involved in any politics. Frederick had time to dictate himself to other passions such as sports, especially cricket. When he was a massive fan of hitting the stick on a ball is what he caused him to die. Frederick died in 1751 out of a burst of abscesses, something like that. That word, yeah. Age 44, he died of that. Reports mentioned that abscesses was caused by a cricket ball that hit the prince during a game. And for some reason, royal people that get hurt back then, they didn't check anything. So to anyone who doesn't know what this is, this word, Thank you. Is a pocket of pus and it can form almost anywhere on your body. And if you get an infection, your body's immune system kicks into action trying to fight it. White blood cells travel to the infected area and build within the damaged tissues. But unfortunately for him, they didn't seem to work that day. Speaking of Frederick and his mean mom, his mother Queen Caroline also had a weird death. In her final years, the queen became quite a corpulent woman. She suffered from gout, so severe that she was usually carried out of the palace in a decorated wheelchair. She also developed medical problems after the birth of her youngest son and the cause of her suffering was a strangulated hernia. Ooh. One day, the pain was so intense that it left her completely bedridden, and her room had ruptured. She was bleeding internally. This led to her death on November 20th, 1737, and when her bow and that's when her bowels burst wide open. Nah, sorry for the visuals, but it happens. I think the, what's worse is that when someone makes a bar out of your death, uh, that's probably the worst thing that could have happened, because apparently a poet named Alexander Pope wrote a verse over her death, and it goes like this. Here lies wrapped up in 40,000 towels, the only proof that Caroline had bowels. Yeah, even back then, men can still be romantic. And finally, Charles II, earning him the nickname Charles the Bad. Uh, his ghastly death was ruled by many as a divine punishment. Uh, several accounts that differ slightly had been given of his death, but most quoted one was of the 18th century English author Francis Blagden. According to him, Charles was very ill, and his physician ordered him to be completely wrapped from neck to toe in linen cloth soaked in brandy. One of the doctor's attendants was sewing up the cloth so that it would be nice and tight and nice and warm, and when they were finished, they wanted to cut the remaining thread, and since this treatment was performed at night, she didn't want to use scissors in case she cut the king, so instead she decided to burn off the thread with a candle. And so the linen, being completely soaked in brandy, when it, the lit wick came close, the king went up in flames, and so you could say he was really feeling the burn, which like most of these royals dealt as shown in history. Starting off this list in our number 10 spot, we have the Kensington system. Queen Victoria's reign began in 1837, and it lasted up until her death in 1908. One. She was just 18 years old when she found herself on the throne, and it was all by chance, as she was actually fifth in line when she was born. This is all stressful enough, but certainly one of the worst parts of her upbringing was being brought up under the Kensington system. This basically all started when her mother, Duchess Victoria of Kent, created this system in order to control her daughter. Literally just isolated her away from all of her friends and even from other family members. And apparently this was done to keep her quote unquote pure. The Duchess would monitor her every move, she would decide who she could see and who she could speak to, and Victoria only had two friends she could play with growing up, one being her half-sister and the other being her mother's attendant, Sir John Conroy. Victoria was even forced to share a room with her mother until she was queen. She couldn't even walk down the hall by herself. In the end, Victoria placed a lot of blame on John Conroy for manipulating her mother. She even called him the demon incarnate. In our number 9 spot today, we have the royal affairs. There have been many, many any rumors over the years about the royal family and their extramarital affairs. Okay, I'm not saying it's a tradition, but it happens a lot, and I'm saying this goes way back. So far back that one of the first accusations of this within the royal family dates all the way back to Henry VIII and Anne Boleyn. Since then, it has only continued with people such as Princess Margaret and Peter Townsend, Princess Anne and Commander Timothy Lawrence, and of course, King Charles and Queen Consort Camilla just to name a few. The latter of those definitely being the most famous, especially when the now king was confronted about it by his wife at the time, the beloved Princess Diana. Apparently, King Charles responded to the confrontation by saying, quote, well, I refuse to be the only Prince of Wales who never had a mistress. Maybe not the attitude to keep when you're speaking to your wife, who you're cheating on. I don't know. 
because I'm just not royal enough to get it. In our number eight spot today, we have pets. As we all know very well, image is everything for the royal family, and that is down to the finest, smallest detail, including pets. It is well known that the queen absolutely loved corgis, and how could we possibly blame her? Apparently, however, if a dog is not a corgi or a Labrador, it is socially looked down upon. Can't describe how insane that is. They're dogs. If you brought a dog who had just been rolling around in the mud everywhere with you, I could see why that wouldn't be as widely accepted among fancy social circles, but only giving the choice of a few random breeds seems kind of ridiculous. Apparently, Meghan Markle actually had to give up her beagle named Guy a few years ago before she joined the family. And then left. It. I guess she can probably have whatever dog she wants now, so there's always an upside. Sir Gerd Estenson's life is a tale of Vikings, pirates, and treachery. And although it's perhaps to be best remembered to have one of those oddest deaths in history, Sir Gerd was the Viking ruler of the island of Orkney whose exploits earned him the name Sir Gerd the Mighty. In true Viking fashion, he sets about conquering the north of Scotland, which was then inhabited by a group of people called the Picts. This brought him into conflict with the early Moray as male Birgit the Booktooth, as the epithets were able to give the person most distinguished feature, as we can pretty much sure that this teeth had been pretty eye-catching. In regards to this, he died by someone biting him. That's how he died. We all yell when we're upset, but sometimes it's just not good because you might die. And in the case of Emperor Venetian I, he definitely did. Venetian was a Roman emperor from AD 364 to 375, and he spent much of his reign defending the borders of the Roman Empire in Europe. Venetian meant with a group of quadi messengers, the Germanic people of the Romans had been fighting constantly to negotiate, you know, a ceasefire. The envoy maintained that the Romans had been wrong to build forts in their land and just could not guarantee that the chiefs would all cease their attacks. Amenius Marcellinian a Roman soldier and historian wrote that Valician then had a burst of mighty fit wrath and just start rage quitting everywhere and to the point that when he did calm down he just suddenly was speechless, passed out, suffocating and his face was so tinged with a fiery flesh that Valician actually worked himself in such a rage it caused him to have a fatal stroke. So the next time you let your anger get the better of you just remember Valician the first who died of a stroke after screaming in rage. So put down that video game, it's not that not that deep. Richard II had a mixed reputation. He is seen as some of a progressive thinking king who despised war and loved art, but his contemporaries saw him as a tyrant, prone to stealing their inheritance. In 1399, he targeted his cousin, Henry Bolingbroke, who I guess it ended up being broke, who returned from exile and not only took back his inheritance, never mind, he wasn't broke at all, but was also claimed at Richard's throne. He was the new Henry IV was initially lenient and seemed to have intended to let Richard live out the rest of his days as a prisoner of the Pontefract Castle in Yorkshire. But a plot by Richard's loyal supporters put an end to that. It is believed to avoid the stigma of spilling the blood of an anointed king, Henry IV had Richard starved to death. Alternately, it's possible Richard died through self-starvation, but either way, he was dead by February 1400. James II, who ruled Scotland for 23 years between 1437 and 1460, his reign is generally looked upon favorably. Acts such as the foundations of the University of Glasgow made him a very popular king. But he was also responsible for reprehensible acts, such as the killings of his Earl of Douglas. In fact, James James showed that he was willing to get rid of anyone who threatened his rule. Even though the Scottish War of Independence was over by the 15th century, certain areas around the borders regions remained under British control. One of them was the Roxburgh Castle. King James thought that he would be able to reclaim this castle for Scotland at a time when English forces was weakened by the War of Roses. But while he was waltzing in, trying to make his way through, making his way downtown, walking fast, faces past, and he was homebound, or more or less cannon bound, he died. And he was killed by a cannon, but not just any cannon, his own. He was standing right too close to it, and instead of just shooting it, it exploded on its own, and honestly, you could say that he had a blast. Being the grandson of George V and the present Queen's first cousin, he was once again a high as fourth in line of the British throne. It is possible that the Prince of Wales named his first son William Duke of Cambridge after him. William apparently suffered from porphyria, which might have been actually what made King George III mad, as he owned several aircraft, ski, drove sports cars, and went ballooning and trekking around the Sahara Desert, despite the skin condition brought on by his illness. His most dangerous hobby, however, was his love of racing aircraft. In August 1972, he was competing with the Goodyear International Air Trophy. When short Shortly after takeoff, his plane banked, left, clipped a tree, and crashed. He and his co-pilot unfortunately died absolutely instantly. Worst of all though is waiting for a nice drink, but realizing it was too hot. But for the emperor, I don't think he ordered this drink intentionally. The Roman Emperor Valerian ruled from 253 to 260 AD, and when he was captured in battle by the Persian Emperor Shapur I, as a prisoner of war, Valerian was subjected to humiliations which included being used as a stepping stool, for which Shapur would use him as a mount for his horse. That's kind of messed up. Sources varies in their description of this eventual execution, with the most gruesome tale being that he was forced to drink molten gold. 
old. An alternative story is offered up by the advisor of the Emperor Constantine I, who alleged that Valerian was flayed alive and his skin was then dyed with vermilion and displayed as a warning to Romans that they should not place too great confidence in their own strength. Although neither account is verified, drinking gold and being flayed alive is both a very horrible, painful way to go, especially seen in history. I don't know about you, but I would be pretty annoyed if I had my royal court by my side 24 7. If you were an Egyptian monarch, most of your waking hours as a pharaoh would be constantly surrounded by people. The associates around you would include members of the royal court, as many officials, family members, nobles, servants, and royal bodyguards would be included. From sunrise to sunset, you would never have a moment alone. Considering getting a position in the royal court, aside from on hired craftsmanship jobs like architects, majority of the nobles that filled the ranks were the pharaoh, friends, and the relatives that were promoted into these positions of court. So, in some way, it was some type of nepotism that benefited you next to the king. Just like in the French monarchy before they ended up being cut off, the Queen Marie Antoinette would wake up with her servants at the foot of her bed ready to help her with her day. And that, it, that does beg the question though, would you be also into that or no? Comment below. However, despite having your fam jam with you at all times, it still doesn't prevent the most obvious fear, and that was family members challenging you for your throne and authority. Like majority of rich civilizations like the Romans, the British, the ancient Egyptians, the ancient Chinese Empire, and so many across the world alike all have the unfortunate circumstances of uprising in your own household. Like as an example with Japan and their empire, there's a theory that some say the emperors in ancient times, such as Emperor Su Jin, Emperor Ojin, and Emperor Keitai, usurped the imperial throne regardless of the blood relations with the past emperors. And in ancient Egypt, the same saying goes with the other rulers like for Ramesses III, one of his wives had apparently orchestrated a rebellion on him so her own son would rule. And of course in England with Queen Elizabeth and her sister Queen Mary, both had conflicts due to their father's many misbehaviors. But even as a royal with so many people tagging along aside you, from the moment you wake up to the moment you wipe your butt on the toilet or even going to bed, it does include what you wore. As a representative of your nation and your people, you had to be dressed to the nines at all times. In ancient Egypt as an example, they took their wigs very seriously as they even also had a law that outlined those who could and could not wear them. Even according to their laws, it was illegal for slaves to wear wigs and if you were an elite member of the court or part of the royal family, you were most likely also going to have a quality wig compared to other people. Most royal wigs were the most elaborate and they would also include gold and silver and threads and even pharaohs would sometimes wear fake beards alongside their wigs for specialized events. Number 7. Father's Death Cleopatra's father Ptolemy the 12th, uh, Alates, died in 51 BCE. Ptolemy the 12th was a member of the Ptolemaic dynasty, which was a Greek origin and ruled Egypt following the death of Alexander the Great in 323 BCE. But the Ptolemies were the last dynasty to rule Egypt as pharaonic kingdoms before the Roman conquest. Ptolemy the 12th died in 51 BCE as long as his death was triggered to a power struggle among his children, including Cleopatra. The Ptolemaic succession often leading to conflicts and rivalries among siblings vying for control over Egypt. After all, his death, Cleopatra initially shared power with her younger brother, Timoli the 13th, but their relationship deteriorated, leading to political instability and eventually the Alexandrian War. In her father, as well as the rest of her family, bloodline being so brutal, so many of her family members from her great 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 grandparents and aunts and uncles had no issue executing one another for power. It's what led her to feeling that, you know, removing her own siblings for her desire for power isn't that big of a deal. Number 6. Her sister's death Cleopatra had several sisters who all died at the hand of Cleopatra herself, and she could not stand the possibility of living against her reign, or them living against her reign. Bernice IV was the younger sister of Cleopatra, and after her death of her father, uh, as we know, Ptolemy the Twelve Alatilis, Bernice briefly became the ruler of Egypt, actually. However, her reign was short-lived, and Cleopatra was able to get the support of Julius Caesar and being able to return to power, leading to the demise of Bernice. Arisinoli the Fourth was also another sister of Cleopatra, and after the Alexandrian War was the defeat of her brother, Cleopatra's younger brother. Arisinoli was taken to Rome by Julius Caesar as part of his triumph, and later, the assassination of Caesar, Arisinoli was pardoned by Caesar's grandnephew and adopted son. Octavian, later Augustus, however, she became involved in a plot against Cleopatra Cleopatra and she was executed. Their family dynasty often saw internal conflicts over succession and control of the throne, leading to complex alliances and betrayals among siblings. The fate of the Bernice IV and Arisinoli IV illustrated the high stakes and political tensions within the Ptolemaic family during the turbulent period of the Egyptian history. I can't say words, I'm so sorry, please. Anyways, number five, I want Julius, not me, but her. Julius Caesar was engaged in a civil war with another Roman leader, Pompey. Pompey had been defeated in a battle and fled to Egypt. 
Caesar was pursuing him, but then Pompey was assassinated upon his arrival in Egypt before Caesar even arrived in Egypt. Caesar was left with idle time, and so Cleopatra arranged to meet Caesar under intimate terms by having herself rolled up in a carpet that is delivered to Caesar's home quarters. When the, when the carpet was unrolled, a vivacious 21 year old Egyptian queen emerges, and Caesar was about 52 at the time. Nasty. Cleopatra captivated him, but it was probably not in her youth but her or her beauty. But Caesar, in general, could have had beautiful young women and had the audacity to admit to Cleopatra's ploy as to amuse him. And it was a br brilliant strategy. Had Cleopatra met Caesar through official state channels protocols, would have interviewed her working her charms on him. And she was up to said to have thousands of ways of flattering. A non unimportant factor in Cleopatra's attraction for Caesar was that she was banking rich. Especially the fact that she was technically, if anything, the richest woman in the world. Or at least she would be once back in the power in Egypt. Caesar was chronically and often disastrously in debt. Because they always are. Number four, her husband's brother's death. Uh, Tripoli. I love that name. Number the 13th and Cleopatra were siblings and members of their dynasty, and the ruling family of Egypt descended from the Tiplony as one of the generals of Alexander the Great. Their relationship was marked by political intrigue, power struggles, and conflicts within the context of the complex and often tumultuous of politics of the Ptolemaic kingdom. Following the death of her father, Tiplony the, th the 12th, Tiplony the 13th and Cleopatra initially ruled Egypt together as joint monarchs. However, their relationship became strained, leading to a power struggle for control over the kingdom. The reason why Cleopatra was kicked out of Alexandria was because of her brother, and that summer she rallied a band of mercenaries at a desert camp under the glassy heat of the Syrian sun. She was 21, an orphan, and in exile. She had already known both excessively good fortune and its flamboyant consort calamity. Accustomed to the great luxury of the days, she held court two miles, 200 miles. She held a court 200 miles from the ebony doors and onyx floors of her home, and her tent amid the scrub of the desert was the closest she had come in a year. Over those months, she had scrambled for her life fleeing from and through Middle Egypt, Palestine, and Southern Syria. She had spent a dusty summer raising an army, and at that point, Cleopatra had become Caesar's mistress, and Caesar used his army to defeat and destroy Cleopatra's rival for power in Egypt, her brother husband. Tepony XIII then dies of drowning in the Nile while trying to escape the battle. Number 3, Another Brother's Death after Tiplony the 13th deaths, Cleopatra had a son with Julius Caesar, Caesarian, became a very potential heir to the Egyptian throne. However, the political dynamics and conflicts with Rome would later impact Caesarian's fate. She needed help overthrowing another brother, her youngest brother, just to ensure the lineage of her bloodline to rule. At this time, uh, at the time of being Caesar, uh, Caesar's mistress, she does give birth to her, their son, a boy, who is also named Tiplony Caesar and also called Caesarian. Her brother, Tiplony the 14th, died of poisoning, undoubtedly under Cleopatra's orders, as she wanted her son, Caesarian, co-regent with her as Tiplony the 15th. Number two, I want Mark Antony. After Caesar had died, Cleopatra had already had her eyes on her backup man. Cleopatra and Mark Antony first met in 41 BCE when Antony was visiting Alexandria. Cleopatra was aware of the political importance of establishing alliances with powerful Roman leaders. So to win Antony's support, their relationship quickly developed into a romantic and steamy political alliance. Cleopatra actively supported Mark Antony's uh, military campaigns, including his efforts against the Parthian Empire. And Antony's military and political ties with Cleopatra contributed to tensions with Rome and Octavian. In 30 in 44 BCE, Antony and Cleopatra organized a grand ceremony known as the Donations of Alexandria. During the events, Cleopatra and Antony declared their children as rulers of various territories, which included parts of the Roman Republic, which as you know, the Republican people did not like. This further fueled the political tension between Antony and Octavian, which leads to our number one. Number one, civil war. Cleopatra had multiple war echoed into her life, from her husband's brother expulsion from her from Alexandria, to which she had Julius Caesar as well as her own army triggering the Alexandria War, and allowing her back into the state, and the battle that led to her demise, the Battle of Actium. The Battle of Actium was a decisive naval engagement between the forces of Cleopatra and Mark Antony against those of Octavian, later known as Augustus, Caesar's adopted son. The conflict was a result of the political tensions and rivalries among the Roman leaders, and the naval battle took place in 31 BCE near Actium in Greece. Cleopatra and Antony faced a significant defeat, leading to their eventual downfall. Following the defeat of Actium, Antony and Cleopatra retreated to Alexandria, facing capture by Octavian's forces, and Antony died by taking his own life. Cleopatra, upon learning of Antony's death, also died, traditionally believed to have been 
uh, taken her own life by a bite of an asp, a venomous snake, but in reality, it was most likely that she had just poisoned herself. Either way, the brutal acts that she had done from eradicating her family ties, influencing powerful men with her own power as power is power, her unnecessary financial wealth that she couldn't utilize properly to win against the Romans in invasions, there was also a lot that she had accomplished, but there was a lot to learn from her ruling. Despite her haters being a very influential woman, she will remain in her legacy for all time. Number 10 is Eric the 14th. That's a lot of Eric's to get to 14, and it's a lot of paranoia in his case. The Swedish king survived three years of ruling before he lost his mind, first taking the throne in 1560, and then having his life taken in 1577. In 1563, when the crazy struck, Eric became violent and paranoid, rubbing his nobility and court members the wrong way until he pulled a daring move, imprisoning the Sturr's noble family for allegedly plotting against him. However, he quickly came to the conclusion that the incarceration wasn't enough and decided to have them killed instead. Eric himself participates in their grisly deaths, and after their death sentences, Eric wandered outside to the woods and disappeared for three days. This led to open conflict between Sweden's nobility and Eric, who was eventually dethroned and imprisoned by his despised half-brother John in 1569. The former king languished in prison for the next seven years before being put out of his misery in 1577. Turns out Eric's paranoia may have been onto something. After the 20th century exhumation, forensic scientists determined Eric died from his pea soup being poisoned. Number 9 is The Glutton, a nickname for King Afonso, also called The Grinning Moron. A nickname he earned from doing things like wearing six hats at once, tiered Mad Hatter style, or because he visited all the nunneries around to offer himself up as a willing bedmate. This is also the king who famously saw his two older siblings die, and instead of crying, he cheered and went, hooray, now I will be the king of Portugal. All of this perceived madness allegedly comes from how Alfonso was ill as a child, and it left him partially paralyzed and mentally unstable. Unfortunately, he found pleasure in violence, and this made for a bad combination, especially when a local boy named Antonio, who liked to whip stones at people, offered the king knives and said he should join. Alfonso's mother tried to stop her son, who now went out at night and tormented the poor villagers, and forbade Antonio to enter the palace. Deprived from Antonio's company, Alfonso became completely unmanageable and refused to eat food like a brat. So they let Antonio back in. He soon established himself in a room next to Alfonso and began to lead the king on nightly excursions, jumping respectable citizens and raiding taverns. This goes on for years until his mother dies and Antonio is sent away. Then Alfonso focuses his attention onto food. At the age of 23, Alfonso was incredibly large thanks to gluttony. He used to take his meals in bed and usually ate and drank so much he was sick afterwards. Ministers ruled on behalf of the screw loose Alfonso for years, but they still tried to make Alfonso behave like a king. Told what to do, he did it. Told what to say, he said it. Still, his way of life infuriated the Portuguese clergy, so they find him a wife, hoping it'd calm him down. Instead, they annul, and she marries his younger, hotter brother, and the two begin planning a coup. In his final days, like many of the other monarchs on this list, he was confined. It was said he wore a groove in the floor from pacing since he couldn't do anything else. Number eight is Snotty King. Unlike Alfonso, who victimized the nearby villages, France's King Charles IX actually went after others in his court, including his sisters and even animals. Charles had a disfiguring birthmark between his nose and upper lip, giving him the nickname the Snotty King, and he was given to fits of rage and sadism, though he was a mama's boy to his regent, Catherine de Medici, who literally ran this country even once the king grew up. In 1561, at the age of 10, Charles took the throne after all eligible heirs had died, through no fault of his own. As he grew up, Charles became tall and physically strong, but his physical and mental problems increased with age, and as one suffered, so did the other. Charles was unbalanced to the point of insanity, and his anger was solved through violence or death that only Margot, his youngest sister, knew how to calm. If she wasn't around, someone would hand him a bow and arrow and say, hey, go hunt some deer nearby. However, things like hunting and field sports didn't satisfy his bloodlust, and that's exactly what it was, bloodlust. To quote Charles himself, he preferred to use the knife because he liked the blood and wanted to see it spurting out of animals. Shudder. So he fed this lust by dismembering domestic animals. He also liked lashing people until they bled, or going down to the blacksmith to beat out weapons for his armory until he was prostate with exhaustion. Then he'd go use them on more animals, or people. And even with these specialized events, wearing fake beards might even suggest engagements. Like in some cultures, you'd have to ask permission to the family's head, or in most cases, the lady's father, to court her or wed her. And in some, this also includes the royal family, aka the British royal family. According to the Royal Marriage Acts in 1772, British royal descendants don't have their liberty to exercise this right of love because they have to seek the monarchy's approval before the proposing. Queen Elizabeth II, when she was alive and well, all the other monarchs after her would also follow suit in the approval of every relations. Even the former Queen Elizabeth II had approved 
of reunion involving her children and grandchildren, including the one between Prince Andrew and Fergie, and the one between Prince Charles and Camilla Parker Bowles. She also extended her blessings approval for William's proposal to Middleton and Harry's request for Meghan Markle's hand in marriage. Also, I know it's now King Charles, I forgot. But aside, like all rules in regards to marriage, this also involves the conversation of succession. In 1688, when it came to the British monarchs, James II fled England and the English Parliament flexed his political muscle and offered the throne to James's daughter Mary and her husband William of Orange instead of his son. Since then, Parliament has basically decided who is king or queen, but they use the same strict criteria. The new ruler must be descendants of the Princess Sophia, the Electress of Hanover, and granddaughter of James I, and a Protestant in communion with the Church of England, who swears to preserve the Church of England and the Church of Scotland. And because of the confliction they had during the Roman Catholic Church due to King Henry VIII's excessive desire to have a son, Roman Catholics are expressively forbidden from ever ruling. The actual order of succession goes through Charles III's family and has been worked out down to the 23rd person, Queen Elizabeth's one-year-old great-grandson, Lucas Tyndall, who has to wait a while, I think. Heirs to the throne are not permitted to travel together. Traveling together for a family vacation is the most awaited times of our lives, but British royal families can't celebrate vacations together as according to the rules, no two heirs can travel together to maintain the order of succession. However, when Prince William and his wife Kate Middleton had children, the prohibition was eased when Prince George turns 12, he will also have to start flying separately from his father. The Cambridges also frequently flown from their children in the past, but typically received special permission from the head of state to do so. It is also a rule that royals must always carry a black outfit while traveling, and reason being is in case there's an unexpected death in the family. This way, they can also be properly dressed to fit the somber occasion when they arrive back to the UK. This rule was created after the unexpected death of Queen Elizabeth's father, King George VI, as she was rushed home from Kenya and had to wait on a plane in London until someone brought her a change of clothes. According to Bustle, it also had been deemed inappropriate for Elizabeth to emerge in London in a normal dress after the death of the king, as well although it's not officially a rule, traditionally royals are expected to wear black only during funerals. Generally, it is also thought black is not worn unless it's in mourning, although Princess Diana, Diana, Princess of Wales, did occasionally wear it for evening functions. The National Geographic documentary of Diana, in her own words, is narrated entirely by the late princess using rare audio recordings made by Diana in 1991. During one scene, Diana recalls a time Charles rebuked her for wearing a black dress during a royal engagement, and he commented she should wear it as black is only for the people who are in mourning, and she responded, Yes, but I'm not part of your family yet. Speaking of death through when it came to the ancient Egyptians, if a family member died, specifically a pharaoh, so did everyone else. In ancient Egypt, they believed that when you passed away, your spiritual body continues into the afterlife, so to a place very similar to the living world, however, an entry to this ethereal paradise was not guaranteed. For he dead must venture on and negotiate a dangerous underworld journey and face a final judgement before they regained access. See, alongside the animals, they were also mummified with their owners, even servants would be buried alongside them. It's a terrifying thought though, that the possibility of your boss dying, so you have to die with them. That way, they have someone to do the house chores around the afterlife still. Do you get extra pay though? I guess there's no point since we're both, you know, not around anymore. But this was also be more common, however, for the pharaoh of Egypt, he did not want to go down alone. So yes, you do have to work for the king, but at what cost? Seems to be a very consistent theme in history. But even with the wives of the pharaohs, or wives of regular men, would also be buried with their partner, and since they too didn't want to linger in the afterlife alone, I mean, I guess, I mean, being alone isn't a bad thing, right? Even with death, came out a note of rumors and cover-ups. Apparently, in some rumors that King George V didn't die peacefully, but was actually comatose, but because he couldn't rule, it was processed made by his physician to inject him with fatal doses of substance. Even the physician's confession, he wrote that he only did it so that the announcement could be beyond time for the morning papers instead of the evening ones. And considering the traditions of wiping out monarchs for the view of the public, the Queen's first cousin had developments of disabilities that were shamefully hidden from the public and was assumed legally dead, when in fact this scandal exploded to the public that the royals just couldn't do that. Well, they could do that to their own members. But the thing is, it wasn't the first time the royals did this, as as we know how progressive the world is now, I'm sure it wouldn't be the last. King George V, the same king who denied the Tsar of Russia his own cousin from amnesty from their own rebellion in Russia, he also tucked away his youngest child from the public because he suffered from epilepsy. And finally, one other odd tradition and more on the lighter side, I guess it is the Waterloo ceremony. Every year, the monarch celebrates the historic British victory of the Battle of Waterloo by having the Duke of Wellington pay rent. It was 
the first Duke of Wellington who, on June 18th, 1815, led British forces to victory against Napoleon, and so as a thank you, the Crown purchased a house in Hampshire for him. Eight Dukes later, the person holding this position still resides in that same house. On June 18th of every year, the Duke of Wellington commemorates the Waterloo victory by paying a rent for the house, but it's not money, it's just purely a symbolic transaction because these people don't pay rent, they don't pay taxes either. During which the Duke gives the Queen a silk embroidered French flag. In the guard chamber at Windsor Castle, the flag is draped over a bust of the Duke of Wellington. Number 10, King Pyrrhus. King Pyrrhus, who ruled the ancient Greek kingdom of Epirus, was also known as a brave and skilled commander, but his death at the hands of an old woman during the Battle of Argos in 272 BC was far from the glorious end. The battle took place in a narrow city streets of Argos, and while Pyrrhus was fighting an Argive soldier, he was hit on the head and fell from his horse. The Greek philosopher and historian Plotarch writes that the soldier's mother was looking down from her house, and when she saw that her son was engaging in a conflict with the king, she was filled with distress in view of the danger of her son, and lifting up a tile with both her hands and threw it at the king. It is not known whether he was killed outright or merely dazed by the blow. Either way, the enemy seized the opportunity and him. Number 9, King Henry I. King Henry I of England decided to indulge in a hearty meal of lampreys, a type of fish that looks like an eel and had circular mouth filled with rows of teeth. Although Henry was fond of the fish, the doctor advised him to avoid them because according to historian Henry of Huntingdon, they always disagreed with him. Henry ignored his physician and chowed down on the forbidden fish. Soon afterwards, they caused a sudden and extreme disturbance under which his age framed sunk into a deathly torpor. Henry I is not the only king to have eaten himself to death, Adolf Frederick of Sweden managed to do it in 1771 after eating copious amount of seafood and then tucking into a semla bun. Then another and another and another until he ate 14 of them and then having stomach problems and then dying. Number 8, the Duke of Clarence. The nobility was usually granted the honor of being privately executed rather than publicly humiliated, which means that their cause of death is sometimes uncertain. This is the case with George Flantagonet, the Duke of Clarence, who was executed for treason by his brother, King Henry IV. In 1478, during the War of Roses, a as rumors soon spread that rather than being or hanged, he was actually drowned in a barrel of wine. Although it may have just been false gossip, his unusual death is a record in multiple histories. Fabian's Chronicle 1516, for example, mentions that Clarence drowned in a butt of Malmacy wine, maybe drinking himself to death, but suppose his death of wine gained even more traction when William Shakespeare included it in his history play Richard III, 1597. In the play, Clarence is stabbed, but then one of his, you know, killers declares, I'll drown you in wine. But wine. Number seven is Fyodor the Bellringer, who was the son of Ivan the Terrible and wasn't thrilled about ruling and left most of it up to his brother in law, Boris Godunov. This would be ruler is remembered for having next to no neck and spindle legs that made him shuffle in a stooped manner. That and his glazed vacant gaze paired with a permanent guiltless smile that was variously ascribed to religious ecstasy or simple mindedness, depending on the observer's point of view. Suffice it to say, even Ivan the Terrible knew his son was missing a few screws. So, anticipating his own death, Ivan had tried to smooth the path for his humbly gifted son by creating a five-member advisory council to help him rule, which is how Boris ends up in charge. Because Fyodor didn't just not know how to rule, but he wasn't interested in doing so. In the 16th century Russia, feeble-mindedness was considered an especially inspired and childish form of wisdom, a foolishness in Christ. Apparently in the olden days, Russians characteristically looked at these persons with respect, if not reverence. This is why unlike so many kingdoms on this list, Fyodor wasn't just tossed in a room and left to rot. Homeboy actually dies peacefully in his bed. Fyodor spent most of his time praying, visiting monasteries and churches throughout the realm, and of course, what he was named for, ringing the bells that called the faithful to mass. Number six is Maria of Portugal. She starts as Maria the Pious, the first undisputed queen regent of Portugal and the first monarch of Brazil, who spent the first 10 years of her reign as an eloquent and respected leader. Then 1786 rolls around and she needs to be carried back into her castle due to a random state of delirium that hits her. Unfortunately, that wouldn't be the last. In 17 Maria loses her husband slash uncle, her eldest son and heir, her only daughter, and then her confessor consecutively. Maria had already been in a fragile state, but their losses caused her to nosedive into religious delirium. Convinced she was going to hell for the sins of her father, claiming to see his black and charred corpse dragging itself along hallways of her home, or in her mind's eye, being tormented by demons. Visitors to her apartments would complain that they were tired of her constant screaming and wailing, which was only amplified by the bloodletting that was meant to cure it. According to some reports, she also became rather fond of wearing really tiny clothing. 
Number five is Charles the Mad. There's many crazy rulers named Charles. Maybe it should have been written off as a royal name at this point. But this Charles may have been mad because of schizophrenia, which nobody in his time would have understood or treated accurately. Honestly, much of the same can be said for multiple rulers on the list as their afflictions were caused by mental illnesses and not always by the fact their parents were also their aunt and uncle. Charles didn't really become crazy at any given point, rather grew into it. He believed he was made of glass, liable to shatter at any moment. To prevent himself from shattering, the king had iron rods sewn into his clothing, the world's first Iron Man. So suck it, Tony Stark. In 1392, Charles attempted to kill his own friend and then got confused as to what was happening while he did it. Coming to, he thought someone else had jumped his friend, so he took an army after the supposed perpetrator. Then he falls back into the same weird state he was in when he tried to kill his friend in the first place and cuts down four of his own men. The others have to drag their king from the horse to get him to stop, at which point he enters a catatonic state and has to be wheeled back to the castle in a car. They concluded that he was probably just under a lot of stress, as it was the first time Charles had really shown signs of not being totally right in the head. In the following years, Charles would go through episodes of forgetting people's names, including his own, and the fact he was king, when he wasn't running through his castle pretending to be a wolf and howling at people. He was later removed from power for acting insane, but not dethroned, since Charles the Mad lived for some 30 years after his first fit of the crazies, while his brother started a civil war for his throne. Number four is the Zengdi Emperor. This Ming Dynasty ruler is one of their most notorious. Unfortunately, not for good reasons to end up on this list. Speaking of, if you're enjoying, maybe take a second to subscribe to The Hive to stay up to date because we have plenty more lists like this. The Zengdi Emperor was renowned for both his foolishness and his cruelty, despite making some major campaign and political decisions that benefited his country. When he wasn't, well, the emperor played pretend. He built a whole fake city block on imperial grounds where he would pretend to be a shopkeeper to the puzzlement of his subjects who were forced to go along with it. Occasionally, he pretended he was an army general despite having no experience or expertise and went on raiding parties where he'd almost get captured. And he'd make the entirety of the army dress in all silk for some reason while doing this. Weirder still, this emperor invented an alter ego he named Zhu Shu, whom he would order on these said pointless raiding parties to the exasperation of his government who had to pretend they weren't just talking to their own emperor in a wig. Ming era novels such as the Zengdi Emperor roams through Jiangnam cast the emperor as a foolish and gullible man, at one point enjoying a bowl of rice gruel he believes to be made from cooked pearls. Number three is Maria Eleonora. Desperate to give her husband an heir, Maria of Sweden had a slew of pregnancy issues that drowned her in postpartum depression and anxiety, on top of the court pressure to even produce a girl at this point, just something as an heir. This was a lot for her mentally, so when she finally did succeed in producing a child, a girl named Christina, she completely completely lost it. The postpartum was too much for this queen who screamed that she hated the dark eyes and the hair of this girl and woed over not having a son and that God was punishing her. Meanwhile, the girl's father was wearing a big hat, cigar in hand, and grinning ear from ear. Christina had to be kept from her unstable mother who couldn't be trusted alone with the girl after some sketchy incidents occurred. That changed when her husband, King Gustavus Adolphus, who was happy to have a daughter, was battle less than two years later. Maria Eleonora responded with hysterical grieving. She shrieked in despair and she was inconsolable, lamenting her cruel fate to be robbed of the light of her life while they were still both so young. That grief, however, included keeping her husband's body above ground for 18 months so she could periodically touch it, cuddle it, and kiss it, you name it. All the while, she made Christina sleep under a golden casket that contained her father's heart. But their relationship improved after that and miraculously Christina grew up to be a functioning woman and queen. Number two is Mustafa of Turkey. This is one where crazy came can't be blamed on the dude himself or the parents being siblings, but rather the classic sultan tradition of locking the royal family away in cages to keep them from usurping the throne. Mustafa I was locked inside gilded cage for 10 years and was actually spared the usual fate of death by his elder brother Ahmed. After his brother died airless, Mustafa is released from his golden cage, but then he's sent back just a few months later when his brother's son took the throne instead. Apparently Mustafa was very neurotic from living in fear of sudden death while locked in a box for 14 years. When his nephew was in a coop just after four years, later in 1622, Mustafa was once again dragged from the safety of his cage to have the crown plopped on his head. He was frequently found running through the palace, knocking on doors and screaming for his dead nephew to come back and rule Turkey again. Many doctors treated Mustafa, but his condition only worsened. He was often seen talking to imaginary people and fed coins to fish and birds. What completely convinced the viziers that something was off was when, during a court meeting, Mustafa yanked on their beards and tossed off their turbans as part of a fit. He was dethroned after three months of rule because 
because he refused to bed a woman and concerns for an heir flourished. That, and he was nuts. Number one is George III, who made it 28 years before he was first hit with his mental illness in 1788, which we now believe to be a case of acute porphyria, anxiety, hallucinations, severe pain, nausea, vomiting, palpitations, high blood pressure, numbness, muscle weakness, brown or red urine, and blindness are some of these diseases' many symptoms, and they were once all found in this wacky king. I said it first hit in 1788, and it hit hard. The king was gibbering for hours on end and foaming at the mouth. Symptoms deemed serious enough for a bill to be drawn up in parliament for his son, George I, to become regent. Before the bill could pass, George, the initial one, recovered from his senses and all was well with the king for the next 11 years. He had a small relapse in 1801 and 1804. Then in 1810, his mental illness came down hard and it never left again. This intelligent, polite family man had turned into a raving lunatic. A visitor to Windsor was astonished to watch the king bury a stake near the castle, believing it would grow into a beef tree. Another saw the king trying to shake hands with an oak tree, believing it to be the king of Prussia. His doctor, Francis Willis, believed the root cause of the mental illness was overexcitement and intended to cure the king by strictly controlling his behavior. If the king acted up, Willis ordered the servants gag him and place him in straight jacket and leave him to thrash around, making incomprehensible noises until he calmed himself down. When the king behaved himself, he was rewarded by being allowed to see members of his family. When he misbehaved, it was back into the straight jacket. Even mealtimes became a carrot and stick exercise. When George was bad, he ate mushed up food from a wooden spoon. When he was good, he got to use cutlery. The final blow came in 1810. Already almost blind due to cataracts, the king suffered a final catastrophic mental breakdown that left him permanently gone. He would babble for hours, lost the ability to walk, and eventually succumbed to dementia. Towards the end of his life, he was incapable of understanding anything, such as the death of his beloved wife, and lived as a long-haired, bushy-bearded recluse in Windsor Castle until his death from pneumonia in 1820. I'll start us off with an obvious name, Queen Elizabeth II. The 20th century saw monarchs across Europe deposed or exiled or worse, executed. Elizabeth grew up surrounded by royal relatives fleeing their home countries amid the chaos of world events and taking refuge in England. But under her reign, Britain's monarchy didn't only survive, it continued to be downright popular and so was she. Advocates for a British Republic frequently cite the Queen's popularity as the reason England remains a monarchy. In his biography, Queen of Our Times, Robert Hartman quotes the Australian Labour Party leader Neville Rand as saying, The biggest problem we've got is the Queen. Everybody loves her. She has been beloved for decades, not for a sparkling charisma or great rhetorical flair, but for her steadfast and superhuman ability to give absolutely nothing away. Never complain, never explain is the unofficial motto of the royal family, and the queen herself served as its living embodiment. Elizabeth lived her life with ferocious discipline, pressing herself into the form of a blank slate onto whom onlookers could project practically anything. She made being a little bit dull into an art form, of which she became the world's greatest practitioner. As such, she provided her monarchy with its great greatest asset. Queen Elizabeth II was anybody her people wanted her to be. Elizabeth's mystique was real. Since the early days of her reign, those who met the Queen were struck by her palpable abilities as a performer. And notably, what she performed was not charm, but stateliness. Throughout her reign, her greatest political weakness was, you guessed it, just being a bit boring. Over the past decade's flurry of royal weddings, gossip, and scandal, the Queen's blank slate has allowed onlookers to imaginatively ally her with whichever camp they pleased, which is so brilliant. Queen Mary I is a ruler who could have reserved a place in common history simply as the first woman ever to be the Queen of England. But she's also remembered as B-L-O-O-D-Y Mary a name she acquired because of her staunch and violent opposition to the Reformation. Look, the interwebs don't like the B word, so I had to spell it out. I hope you figured out what I was trying to say. The most controversial part of her reign was her religious policy. Despite promises a month into her rise to the throne that she would not pursue forced conversion of Protestants, Mary had leading Protestant churchmen imprisoned. She sought to reaffirm papal jurisdiction over England, and when the deal with Rome succeeded, the hearsay acts were reinstated, which allowed for burning of heretics. This sent a wave of fear throughout England in around 800 Protestant nobles immediately fled the country, and in February of 1555, the executions began. Protestant Archbishop Thomas Cranmer was forced to watch the bishops Nicholas Ridley and Hugh Latimer being burned at the stake. Cranmer repented his Protestant faith, and Teckenclander Law should have been absolved, but Mary refused to accept his absolution and had him burned at the stake to set an example. By the end of her terror, Mary had almost 300 people executed, and just for being Protestant. Her reign was relatively short, lasting a little over five years, and she died in 1558 from either ovarian cysts or ovarian cancer, and was succeeded by Elizabeth I, who we'll talk about more in a moment, but 
She was history making, you gotta admit that. Before we get back into the ease, time to talk about Queen Victoria. The term, the Victorian age, sounds kinda stodgy and probably makes you think about stupid stereotypes, about uncomfortable fashions, and an excess of polite verbiage. The queen the age was named after, however, was anything but polite. Until Elizabeth II, Victoria was the longest reigning English monarch. And during that time, she survived no less than seven assassination attempts. More importantly, many modern thinkers attribute the roots of the suffrage and feminist movements, in part, to Victoria. Victoria's grace under the incredible pressure of ascending the throne at the age of 18, and her refusal to be anything but a strong monarch. In her first 18 years before that, Victoria spent every waking minute in the company of her mother and uncle, preparing for the eventual day where she would don a crown and become the ruler of the British Empire. When that day arrived, she became only the fourth woman in history to take on the role. Despite her youth and inexperience, this determined woman changed the world and how it viewed the British monarchy forever. Her first order as queen was to be given an hour alone for the previous previous 18 years she had to be with somebody at all times, and well that's because she was sick of it. She then exiled her mother to the other side of the palace, and her mother wasn't allowed to speak to Victoria unless requested by Victoria herself. Goals. While her role as queen was largely ceremonial in the United Kingdom's constitutional monarchy, she nonetheless managed to cause a government crisis when she refused to allow a new prime minister to replace the ladies of her court with ones from his political party. Honestly, a girl boss. Number 7. King Edward II Edward II's rule of England was fraught with controversy, much of which is stemmed from his relationship with Piers Gavin. The nature of their relationship remains unknown, although it speculates that they were lovers, maybe they were just roommates. Regardless, the English king's close bond with his favourite and poor leadership led to Queen Isabella and the nobility killing him. Many modern historians believe that he was simply left without food and water to die of natural causes. However, medieval historians claim that a hot poker was inserted into his butt to burn his bowels. Uh, in the Chronicles explains that this was also done as no apparent of any wound or hurt outwardly might have one perceived. Another account states that Edmund was killed by an assassin who hid himself in the toilet below and struck the king twice with a very sharp knife into the private parts, and leaving the weapon in his butt, and he fled away. Although it is benefited from his death, both Huntington and William of Malmesbury claim that it was an Englishman, Adric Sterona, who hired the assassin, and when he was subs subsequently executed for the crime, he breathed out his abnormal spirit to hell. Mm. Number 6. Emperor Valerian The Roman Emperor Valerian ruled from AD 253 to 260 when he was captured in battle by the Persian Emperor Shapur I. As a prisoner of war, Valerian was subjected to humiliations, which included being used as a stepping stool from which Shapur would mount his horse. Sources vary in the description of this eventual execution, with the most gruesome tale being that he was forced to drink molten gold. An alternative story is offered up by an advisor to Emperor Constantine I, who alleged that Valerian was flayed alive and his skin was then dyed with vermilion. And displayed as a warning to the Romans that they should not place too great confidence in their own strength. Although neither account is verified, drinking gold and being flayed alive are both very horrible, painful ways to go. Kind of like Game of Thrones where they poured gold on that one king. Number 5. Sergurd Essenson The first Earl of Orkney was the leader of a Viking attack on Scotland, and while few details of his life made the history books, his unusual death certainly did. Although his attempted invasion of northern Scotland in 892, he agreed to an even fight against a royal steward called Malbergen. Each leader was supposed to fight alongside 40 men, but Sergurd cheated by mounting 80 men across 40 horses. Sergurd won the battle, of course, and then tied his enemy and his head in a straddle as a, tro as a trophy. The Norse history text reports that this was actually his fatal mistake, as he was known for being a buck tooth, a particularly prominently pearly white caused a wound on his leg as he rode. The wound quickly became infected, and Sergurd died. His enemy may have been decapitated, but he may have revenge in death. Number 4. Emperor Valician I Valician apparently died of a stroke after screaming in rage. Valician was a Roman emperor from AD 364 to 375 and spent much of his reign defending the borders of the Roman Empire in Europe. Valician met what a group of Quadi messengers, the Germanic people of the Romans had been fighting for a long time to negotiate a ceasefire. The envoy maintained that the Romans had been wrong to build forts, forts in their land and could not guarantee that all chiefs would cease their attacks. Emimanus Marcolinius, a Roman soldier and historian, wrote that Valician that burst into a mighty fit of wrath and that he once calmed down was suddenly speechless and suffocating and his face was tinged with a fiery flush. Felician had worked himself into such a rage that he actually gave himself a stroke. Number 3. Emperor Qin Shi Huang Qin Shi Huang unified China for a first time, after which he took the title of emperor in 
221 BC and then began his process of building the Great Wall of China. Alongside these huge achievements, he was also obsessed with trying to live forever. In his attempt to achieve more mortality, his alchemist prepared elixirs for him to drink, but his habit of consuming wine mixed with honey and mercury led to his death at the age of 49. Mercury would have also followed him into the afterlife as he was buried in the city sized mausoleum guarded by a life sized terracotta army, which supposedly featured rivers of mercury. Until his resting place was discovered in 1974, it was thought that the writings of the Han Dynasty historian Sima Qian greatly exaggerated the magnificence of his tomb, but he was proven correct about the huge number of clay figures and may also be right about the rivers of mercury. However, this will still remain a mystery until the technology is developed to enter the tomb without damaging the contents. Number two, Duke Jing. Duke Jing ruled the state of Jin in the ancient China between 599 and 581 BC and died shortly after he abdicated due to an illness. According to the ancient text, the Zuo Zhuang, Jing consulted a shaman after being visited by a demonic entity in a nightmare. The shaman told me that he would not live to taste the new wheat, and Jing struggled on. And when the wheat was ready to be eaten, he had the shaman killed for making an incorrect prediction. Either just before he tucked into the tasty wheat or just after, he suddenly felt the need to go to the washroom. It is unknown why, but Jing fell in and eventually drowned in a pit of urine and feces. Drowning in general in any way is a bad way to go, but drowning in excrement is particularly grim. The servant who fished his body out of the latrine also so suffered a horrible death as they were buried alive with Jing. Sucks. And finally, number one, George V. George was the grandson of Queen Victoria and was responsible for the royal family adopting the name Windsor in 1917. He had been repeatedly ill since a fall in 1915 and didn't help that he was a heavy smoker and suffered from bronchitis. By January 1936, it was evident that he was ill for the last time and his royal physician was summoned. Rather than waiting for the end to come naturally, Dawson decided the king needed to die before midnight so the news would break in the morning edition of the Times rather than less appropriate evening journals. Yeah, this guy's a, a real one. Without the royal family's knowledge or the king's approval, he bumped him off with a lethal injection of morphine and cocaine. What's worse is that he may have struck again two years later as George's sisters, Queen Maud of Norway, was visiting England when she suddenly became ill. She survived the abdominal surgery Dawson performed, but subsequently died of heart failure later after. Ominously, Lord Dawson reported to her Norwegian doctors that her death was a release, which saved her from these last painful stages of the disease, which was apparently was cancer. It's kind of giving a little Michael Jackson controversy, to be honest. Number 10, King Edward VIII, who abdicated the throne to marry Wallace Simpson, who we know is for his controversial lifestyle. By controversial, I mean, sir, you are disgusting, as he was accused of being sympathetic to the dictator regime in Germany during World War II. And the suspicions about his loyalty led to the forced abdication in 1936. Although this was more of a core reason for his abdication, he masked his political alignment as a sacrifice for love. On December 11th, 1936, he delivered a radio broadcast to the nation announcing his decision to abdicate, famously stating, I have found it impossible to carry the heavy burden of responsibility to discharge my duties as king as I wish to do without the help and support of the woman I love. The woman you love or the fact that you're more interested in a dictator regime that caused millions of deaths? Ah, who knows. But this is why we need to catch the underlying selfishness. Number 9, King Louis XVI and Queen Marie Antoinette face charges of treason during the French Revolution, leading to their arrest, trial, and ultimately their execution by guillotine. The charges were rooted in their perceived opposition to the revolutionary ideals and their attempts to escape from France, which had further fueled suspicion and hostility. Their reign was marked by economic hardship, political unrest, and allegations of extravagance. The storming of the Bastille on July 14, 1789 marked the beginning of the French Revolution. The people's discontent with the monarchy, the perceived tyranny, and economic inequalities fueled revolutionary sentiments. Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette attempted to escape from Paris to Veronese in June 1791. The failed escape, known as the Flight to Veronese, or Veronese heightened the suspicions of the king's opposition to the revolution and his collusion with foreign powers. Powers. In 1792, the French monarchy was then finally abolished, and then the first French Republic was then declared. Number eight, Prince Carl of Sweden. In 2012, Prince Carl Philip of Sweden faced criticism and legal issues after he was caught racing his Porsche at high speed in Stockholm. He was fined and had his driver license suspended, as reports suggest that he was caught speeding and was involved in a collision with a photographer who was attempting to take pictures of the prince's car. And the incidents occurred on a street where the speed limit was 50 kilometers an hour, approximately 31 miles per hour. Prince Carl Philip was reported to be traveling at a higher speed when the collision occurred, and the photographer 
sustained minor injuries and was taken to the hospital for treatment. Following the incidents, there was a public and media attention on Prince Carl Phillips' driving behavior, and the incident raised questions about the safety and private concerns associating with paparazzi chasing public figures. So, in summary, both could technically be held accountable, as it's been noted with paparazzi's following public figures, specifically royals, had it not been efficient in positive aspects. Considering the losses of Princess Diana as an example, personally, both photographer and royal should be held accountable, especially the one that was racing. Next up, we have Wu Zetian. Look, I know I said in the title of today that I'd be talking about queens, but I support all women's impacts on history, and rulers in other countries tend to have different titles to their equivalent of queens. Also, princesses count as well. Look, I'm wearing the crown right now. I make the rules. Hu Zetian was born to a relatively wealthy family and had extremely progressive parents, becoming well versed in a wide range of subjects, including writing, music, literature, and perhaps most importantly, politics and governmental affairs. By the age of mm -mm, Wu was summoned to the imperial palace to become a concubine of Emperor Taizong. After his passing, the newly anointed Emperor Li Zi, the youngest son of the late emperor who became Emperor Gaozong, brought Wu to the imperial court to be his own concubine. In 654, Wu bore a daughter, but shortly Shortly after having the daughter, it passed, with evidence showing, uh oh. Wu accused Empress Wang of the death, and Wang lost favor with the emperor. And the most popular theory is that Wu was actually the cause of death of her daughter. Thereafter, the emperor conferred with his chancellors, and despite opposition, demoted Wang, having her imprisoned and promoted Wu to empress. Later on, the emperor considered having Wang released, but Wu had her executed upon hearing this. Like her political prowess. Incredible. Upon her accession to the throne, Wu began targeting officials who had opposed her rise to power, having them arrested and imprisoned, exiled, forced to take their own lives, or executed. In 664, she accused several officials of witchcraft and had them, well, sentenced to death, and their families became slaves within the imperial palace. In another incident, she ended the life of her niece with poison, accused two others of the death, and that was the end of them. She did eventually pass after repeated bouts with illness, but not without leaving her mark on history. I'm not saying she was a great woman in terms of ethics, but the mark she had, you gotta admit, historical. Next up, Queen Boudicca. Back when Britain was an island full of warring tribes, Boudicca inherited her kingdom from her husband, despite his will ceding control to the Roman Emperor. Since Roman rule wasn't particularly benevolent or beneficial to the Iceni people, Boudicca wasn't just robbed of her kingdom, but harmed and taken advantage of. So she then led a revolt against Rome, raising a massive army of 100,000 people and killing nearly that many as she raided her way across the province. Fond of riding a chariot flanked by her daughters, Boudicca enjoyed early successes. But in a pattern that Rome repeated many times, the empire slowly organized and recovered from the shock, and the British rebels were destroyed. No one's entirely certain what happened to Boudicca or her body, but her legacy as one of the most dangerous women who ever lived survives to this day. Alrighty, time for a monarch I've made you wait for. Queen Elizabeth I. So she isn't exactly known for her fighting abilities or her military strength, although she did hold her kingdom together at a moment in history when it came closer to falling apart than ever before. But what really makes the Virgin Queen such a fierce historical figure is the way she played the political game, turning her historical disadvantages, you know, her gender, into her most powerful playing card. Elizabeth I used her marriage and reproductive prospects ruthlessly and brilliantly, first to shore up her claim to the throne, and later to manipulate the powerful men who sought to supplant, stifle, or assassinate her. Considering she ascended to the throne after being imprisoned and nearly executed, she is certainly one of the fiercest queens in history. Alright, we got another instance of technically not a queen, but a lady ruler, Julia Agrippina. Also referred to as Agrippina the Younger, was Roman Empress from 49 to 54 AD, the fourth wife and niece of Emperor Claudius, and the mother of Nero. After the death of her first husband, Agrippina tried to make shameless advances to the future Emperor Galba, who showed no interest in her, and was devoted to his wife, Amelia Lepida. On one occasion, Galba's mother in gave Agrippina a public reprimand and a slap in the face before a whole bevy of married women. Whoopsies. But Agrippina was one of the most prominent women in the Julio Claudian dynasty, functioning as a behind the scenes advisor in the affairs of the Roman state via powerful political ties. She maneuvered her son Nero into the line of succession. Now, Claudius became aware of her plotting, but died in 54, and it was rumored that Agrippina was the one who poisoned him. Agrippina exerted a commanding influence in the early years of Nero's reign, but in 59 she was killed. But both ancient and modern sources describe Agrippina's personality personality as ruthless, ambitious, violent, and domineering. Not to be all modern, but like, a girl boss if I've ever seen one. Time to venture into more princess territory with Princess Mako. So Japanese imperial law states that princesses are not allowed to marry commoners. So when they do, they are expected to give up their position in the royal family. Princess Mako, the granddaughter of Emperor Akihito, was very much aware of this when she announced her engagement to Kai Kumoro in 2017. She said in a press conference that she has always known what the consequences of her decision would be. So she strived to fulfill her duties while she still could. So she gave up her title in 2021 and now works at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, assisting curators with the museum 
Museum's Asian art collection. So not as crazy as some of the other gals I've mentioned today, but giving up your life's legacy for love is memorable and meaningful in my book. Well, it is common for royals to stay out of politics, but Undies, Princess Esther thought rolling up her metaphorical sleeves and getting involved was the only way she could restore peace to her nation. After spending time in exile in France, after her father and uncle's assassination in the 1970s, she became France's first black model before deciding to return to her homeland and run for president. Even though her presidential bid was ultimately unsuccessful, she was able to show the young generation, especially women, that nothing is impossible. Incredible. So we're ending off today with the iconic Diana, Princess of Wales. Both before and after her ill-fated marriage to Prince Charles, Lady Diana Spencer, later the Princess of Wales, never really paid attention to royal rules. Arguably, no royal member since King Edward VIII changed the course of the House of Windsor more than Princess Diana. With Diana came a new vision of royalty, and frankly, a harsh reality check on this old institution. Whether it was walking through landmine sites, hugging HIV-positive patients, dating billionaires, or being photographed in swimsuits, Diana always made headlines. She defied the royal family's unwritten rule of never complain, never explain, choosing to speak to the media about her struggles with postnatal depression, bulimia, and inspiring others to seek help. There will never be somebody like her. Starting off our list today, we have the former king of Denmark, Christian VII, a man who spent pretty much his entire life acting like a child. Christian took to the throne at just 16 years of age in 1766, during which time he caused many a scandal and much chaos for his royal family members as well as his wife, his staff and his people. Some of Christian's crazy quirks included inviting important guests and dignitaries to dinner parties, and then when the dignitaries greeted him and bowed, the king would hop over their backs as though he was engaging in a game of leapfrog. And once everyone was seated for dinner and the food was served, the young king would begin flinging the menu items around the room at his dinner guests. After marrying his cousin just one year after taking the throne, Christian would often run through the streets of his kingdom with his mistress, patronizing local local shops and brothels in drunken fits of bad behavior. It is also said that at one point in time the young king built his own torture rack and ordered people to tie him to the device and flog him in some sort of strange pursuit of pleasure. Next up on our list today we have Emperor Zheng, another young ruler who partook in some pretty strange behaviors while in power. At the age of just 14, Zheng became the 11th emperor of the Ming dynasty in 1505 and ruled until he passed at the age of 29 in 15. Uninterested in being a ruler at such a young age, and an interest that would remain all the way into adulthood, the emperor assigned eunuchs to all positions of power and allowed them to run the government in his place. While ignoring his duties, the young ruler engaged in various lavish and outlandish behaviors and activities, which were paid for by the tax dollars of his people. If you are thinking that this is already sounding pretty bad, listen up. Because one of Zheng's all time favorite activities was raiding the homes of the wealthy kidnapping their daughters and then demanding a ransom for the girls safe return. And anyone who disputed this reckless behavior was arrested, tortured, and executed. And as you can imagine, there were a lot of people who disputed this behavior. The terror did eventually come to a fitting end when in 1505, the emperor's pleasure barge capsized and Zheng drowned in the chaos. After his death, the eunuchs, which had been placed in charge of running China's government, had garnered so much power within political structures that even new rulers of the dynasty were unable to remove the eunuchs from their positions. Next up, we've got Catherine the Great, Empress of Russia, who, in all fairness, was a pretty good ruler. In fact, some might even say great. The scandal here really lies in her, um, extracurricular appetite. Catherine, originally named Sophie, was born in Germany but moved to Russia after marrying her husband, Peter III, in 1745. It was said that Peter had much less of an appetite and he often disregarded his wife's company for that of toy soldiers and imaginary worlds. Thus began Catherine's spy into sexual insatiability. In 1796, one of Catherine's many lovers murdered Peter and she took her position as Empress of Russia. After stepping into power at the age of 33, her desires for the company of men only grew, and she was by no means frugal towards her lovers either, gifting one with 1,000 laborers and declaring another King of Poland, who she eventually declared war against after a pretty fierce lover's spat in which Catherine accused him of being unobedient. The 
story of Catherine's death has been quite disputed over the years, but one version tells that she met her end during a zealous rendezvous with a palace horse. Historians, however, maintain that she suffered a stroke on the toilet and died the following day, which is the most likely, but a far less interesting explanation for sure. Next up, we have Justin II, Emperor of Byzantium. Next up, we have Justin II, Emperor of Byzantium, which at its peak included modern day Italy, Greece, Turkey, as well as some portions of North Africa and the Middle East. During Justin's rule from 1565 to 1578 AD, he was prone to acting up. He was known for constantly trying to bite officials of the court, making animal noises at passersby, and hitting people at random, unprovoked times. Many officials of the court would take turns pulling the mad emperor around the castle in a wagon in an attempt to calm his nerves, but unfortunately all efforts proved futile and people began to speculate that Justin was possessed by the devil. It was at this time that his wife Sophia, who was taking care of him, became kind of like a regent, making many political decisions on his behalf. From possessed by the devil to worshipping it, we have Marquise de Montespan, who was accused of just that after she caused a whole lot of trouble way back in the late 16 and early 1700s. You see, although both the Marquise and the King of France, Louis XIV, were married, the two had sparked up an affair for the ages, and they weren't exactly subtle about it either, with the King on many occasions showering the Marquise with intricate gifts and spending more time with her than his actual wife, Marie Therese of Austria. Austria. It appears, however, that much like Catherine the Great, Marquise became insatiable, infatuated with the king's attention, and she wished to become queen herself. Marquise de Montespan divorced her husband and began spending more time with the queen in an attempt to assess the situation and figure out her next best steps, during which time she also befriended a Parisian witch. Together, the witch and the Marquise began cooking up love potions made from the bones of some incredibly vulnerable members of society. It was this gruesome feat that led many to believe Marquise had turned to devil worship in the first place. Everything began to fall apart in 1679 after many, many members of the court experienced poisoning and the two women came under investigation. The witch was burnt at the stake while Marquise ran for the hills, in which she ironically spent the rest of her days living in a convent. Number 7, Princess Haya bint al Hussein. Prince Haya bint al Hussein is a member of the Jordanian royal family attracted to international attention due to her legal and personal situation. Princess Haya is the half sister of King Abdullah II of Jordan and the sixth wife of Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid al Maktoum, the ruler of Dubai and the Prime Minister of the United Arab Emirates. In early 2019, Princess Haya left Dubai and traveled to the UK with her children. The case brought attention to broader issues of personal freedoms, human rights, and the complexity of dynamics within the royal family. The the settlement marked the resolution of the legal proceedings in the UK, but it also highlighted the challenges faced by individuals even within royal circles when seeking protection and legal remedies in cases of personal disputes. Number 6, the husband of Princess Caroline of Monaco, Prince Ernest August, had faced legal issues over the years, including altercations and conflict with the law. In the past, he had been involved in disputes, including an altercation case in 2000 for which he was fined, and in 2020, he reached a settlement after another altercation with the hotel owner that he was staying at, and also had another altercation with the police as well the same year of 2020. The incident occurred at the Royal Hunting Lodge in Gronau last July in 2021 when, according to Austrian news agency APA, he called the police claiming an employee wanted to kill him. Reported at the time that the Royal called the police asking for immediate help and when the police arrived, the newspaper reports that he was extremely aggressive and attacked the police physically. Additionally, he claimed that he threatened the police officers with a knife before hitting an officer in the face after the knife was knocked out from his hand. The Royal dispute the claim at the time saying instead that it was the officers who had attacked them, but since then the royals have actually had a change of heart and apologized for his past behavior in court. Number 5, the former wife of Crown Prince Maha Varijalongkorn of Thailand, Princess Sirasami faced legal issues related to her family's involvement in corruption and criminal activities. The controversy led to her divorce from the Crown Prince. Some of Sirasami's family's members faced legal consequences including arrests and prosecutions for various offenses. The legal actions were part of a broader effort by the Thai authorities to address corruption and illegal activities within the royal family and associated circles. The case had significant repercussions for the Thai royal family as it brought attention to issues of corruption and misuse of power within royal circles. The crown prince decision to divorce the princess was seen as a measure to distance the monarchy from the alleged criminal activities. As the Thai monarchy is highly revered and discussions related to the members of the royal family are often very sensitive, and authorities in Thailand have very strict laws against defaming or insulting the monarchy. 
Number 4. Prince Jeffrey, the brother of the Sultan of Brunei, faced legal issues relating to misappropriation of funds and financial misconduct. The legal disputes involved family members and the Brunei government settlements were reached in various cases. Reports suggest that he was involved in mismanaging billions of dollars from the country's coffers for personal use and extravagant spending. Legal battles ensued, and the Brunei government sought to reclaim assets including luxury real estate, aircraft, and other valuable possessions. Over the years, there were multiple legal settlements and agreements between Prince Jeffrey and the Brunei government to resolve the financial disputes. These settlements involved the return of assets and funds to the Brunei government, and Prince Jeffrey agreed to certain conditions. As he was known for his extravagant lifestyle, Prince Jeffrey was also including ownership of luxury properties, yachts, and a vast collection of artwork. And the legal disputes and Prince Jeffrey's extravagant lifestyle garnered international attention and raised question about financial governance within the royal family of Brunei. Number 3. Prince Laurent of Belgium Prince Laurent, the younger brother of King Philippe of Belgium, had faced various controversies, including accepting payments from foreign governments without the government's approval. He was sanctioned by the Belgian government, resulting in a reduction of his annual spending. In 2011, Prince Laurent attended a diplomatic reception in full military uniform without the approval of the government. This sparked extreme controversy as protocol dictates that the royal family members must seek government approval if he was going to wear an outfit like that. As well as in 2017, Prince Laurent attended a reception at the Sri Lankan embassy in Brussels without the government's approval again. And this raised concerns due to the political situation in Sri Lanka at the time. He always seems to like to do stuff or go to places he's not supposed to because again in 2011, Prince Laurent made an unauthorized visit to Democratic Republic of Congo DRC, which led to the diplomatic tensions between Belgium and Congo. The Belgian government emphasized that Prince Laurent's visit did not have official approval. And the incident strained the relationship with the DRC government. Prince Laurent established a foundation dedicated to wildlife conservation, but the foundation faced criticism for accepting funds from the Azerbaijani government. It's like he's doing stuff, but he didn't get the memo that he wasn't supposed to do it. Number two, money, 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 as Princess Christina, the sister of King Philippe VI of Spain, faced charges of tax fraud and money laundering and connections with her husband's business dealings. In 2017, she was acquitted of the charges, but her husband was convicted. The case known as the News Case focused on the embezzlement of public funds through the News Institute. Your Dengren was accused of using his royal connections to secure lucrative contracts for the organization and then diverting funds for personal use. In 2014, Princess Christina became the first member of the Spanish royal family to face criminal charges. She was indicted on charges of tax fraud and money laundering, and in February 2017, the court acquitted the princess of criminal charges related to tax fraud. However, the court found her husband completely guilty of the embezzlement fraud and tax evasion. The legal proceedings and the associations of the member of the royal family with a corruption case led to public outcry and contributed to the decline of the popularity of the Spanish monarch. Number one, very nasty boy, Prince Andrew, the second son of Queen Elizabeth II, faced allegations of sexual conduct and involvement with the one and only Jeffrey Epstein a convicted offender. In 2019, he stepped back from the royal duties and faced legal challenges related to these allegations. Prince Andrew has had a lot of scandals, especially involving with the convicted offender that we had mentioned earlier. Considering that there was a lot of illegal involvement in trafficking, including the violent non-consensual involvement of a 17-year-old girl. Because he was a prince, a powerful rich man, he was able to commit these crimes undercover. But once the news got wind of it, it turned into a whole hurricane. The royal general response to his involvement in the Epstein scandal should go down as a lesson into what not to do in a PR crisis. Following the bumbling interview, Prince Andrew announced that he would then step down from public duties for the unforeseeable future, reportedly because his mom told him not to, which is the queen. Actually, no, his mom told him to step down. The prince had also been stripped of his military titles and is no longer allowed to use the phrase His Royal Highness, an official capacity, a change that took place in the day after the case was allowed to go forward in January. Number 10, Mary the First. Now, this is a ruler who could have reserved a place in common history as the first woman ever to be the Queen of England. Instead, she is mostly remembered as Life Juice Mary, the name that she acquired because of her staunch and violent opposition to Reformation. I can't say the real word because the internet. Life Juice can mean many things, but I hope that you know which Mary is known for being repeated in the mirror, especially when it's in the dark and scary. The most controversial part of her reign was the religious policies. Despite promises a month into her rise to the throne that she would not pursue forced conversion of Protestants, Mary had leading Protestant churchmen imprisoned. She sought to re firm papal jurisdiction over England, and when the deal with Rome succeeded, the heresy acts were reinstated, which allowed for the burning of heretics. This sent a wave of fear through England, and around 800 Protestant nobles immediately fled the country. In February 1555, the executions began. Protestant 
Archbishop Thomas Kramer was forced to watch the bishops Nicholas Ridley and Hugh Latimer being burned at the stake. Kramer repented his Protestant faith and technically under law, he should have been absolved as a reptant, but Mary refused to accept Cranmere's absolution and had him burned at the stake as well to set an example. I do apologize if I'm butchering any of these names. By the end of her terror, Mary had almost 300 people executed, most of them by burning at the stake, simply for the crime of being Protestant. Her reign was relatively short, lasting a little over five years since she passed away in 1558 from either ovarian cysts or ovarian cancer and was succeeded by Elizabeth I. Number 9. Wu Zetian Wu Zetian was born to a relatively wealthy family and had extremely progressive parents, becoming well versed in a wide range of subjects, including writing, music, literature, and most importantly, politics and governmental affairs. At the age of 14, Wu was summoned to the imperial palace to become a concubine of Emperor Taizong. After his passing, the newly anointed Emperor Li Zi, the youngest son of the late emperor who became Emperor Gaizong, brought Wu to the imperial court to be his own concubine. In 654, Wu bore a daughter, but shortly after the birth, it passed away, with evidence showing strangly wangly things. You know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Wu accused Empress Wang of the passing, and Wang lost favor with the Emperor. The most popular theory is that Wu actually took her own daughter out. Thereafter, the Emperor conferred with his chancellors, and despite opposition, demoted Wang, having her imprisoned, and promoted Wu to Empress. Later on, the Emperor considered having Wang released, but Wu had her executed upon hearing this. Upon her ascension to the throne, Wu began targeting officials who had opposed her rise to power, having them arrested and imprisoned, exiled, forced to take their own lives or just straight up executed. In 664, she accused several officials of witchcraft and had them executed as well, and their families were forced into labor within the imperial palace. In another incident, she ended her niece with poison, accused two others of the passing, and executed them just to make things look good. She eventually passed after repeating bouts with illness, and sadly, there's nothing nefarious about that. Number 8. Isabella of Castile When Isabella was born on the 22nd of April in 1451, there was little chance that she would ever become a monarch of Castile, as she was far removed from the direct royal lineage. War, politics, and subterfuge intervened, however, and for many years the Kingdom of Spain was in turmoil, suffering from civil unrest and treasonous subterfuge. To quell one of the rebellions, the hand of Isabella was promised to the commoner Pedro Guiron Acuna Pacheco. Again, I'm sorry if I butchered it. But on his way to her, he suddenly fell ill and he passed away. This immensely fortuitous event for Isabella cemented her devotion to her faith, since she, you know, didn't exactly want to marry a commoner and prayed for divine intervention. Her marriage to Ferdinand, heir to the throne of Castile and Aragon, cemented her future power. After the passing of the King of Castile, the throne was given to Isabella. Her cruelty is recognized in the treatment of non-Christians, which led to the formation of the Spanish Inquisition. Known for its extreme brutality and torture of mostly Jewish and Muslim folks, Isabella waged war on the Kingdom of Granada, the last Muslim kingdom in Spain and the last piece to fall in the Spanish Reconquista. While some may see it as the liberation of Spain, for a lot of other people, it was just open genocide. By the time Grenada was annexed, 100,000 people were either deceased or enslaved. Next up, we have Peter the Great, who was a pretty interesting guy, but unlike Catherine, he wasn't really all that great or all that liked by the Russian people, over which he kept rule. While he has been credited with leading widespread reforms that led Russia to become one of the leading powers in Europe, he was less than empathetic in regards to his subjects. John Evelyn, an author in the 1600s, recounted a time he had invited Peter to stay in his home, saying that the Tsar of Russia, along with an entourage, trashed the author's place, destroying portraits and priceless family heirlooms, tearing apart the gardens, and soiling at least 12 blankets. Whatever that means. Perhaps though the strangest thing that Peter did was implement a beard tax, in which he required the country's residents to either shave their faces or pay a fine for their insubordination. His members of staff, however, were not given this option and instead were lined up to have their faces shaved by Peter himself. It is important to note that during this time it was believed by Russia's Orthodox Church that having a bare face was a sin and went against God, but Peter insisted, saying that the new look was a necessary sacrifice in order to keep up with the trends of the more advanced Western Europeans. 
Next up we've got King Charles VI who ruled France from 1380 to 1422. It seems in 1392 the king suffered from a high fever and convulsions which apparently was the beginning of his downfall as directly after the illness Charles began slowly slipping into insanity. He experienced bouts of paranoia and rage which caused him to become a danger to anyone around him during the episodes. Perhaps his strangest symptom however was the reoccurring belief that his entire body was made of glass. And when this delusion occurred, he would refuse to move for hours on end, terrified of breaking. It even got so bad that at one point he had to be cut out of his clothes after neglecting his hygiene and refusing to change for days out of fear that he might simply shatter. Next on our list today, we have Justinian II, not to be mistaken with Justin II. Justinian II ruled Byzantium in the year 685 AD. In another great example of why children should not be given such high positions of power, at the at the age of just 16, Justinian took to the throne with a brutality soaked iron fist, murdering those who served him out of spite for losing battles, persecuting religious minorities, and imposing high taxes on his people in order to pay for armies and buildings are only a few of the many horrible acts performed by Justinian that eventually led to the people turning on him. I guess at some point his subjects became so sick of his terror that they started an uprising to overthrow his rule during which they forcefully slit his tongue and cut off his nose in order to deter him from ever seeking to regain the throne. Justinian eventually replaced his nose with a gold prosthetic and, much to the public's dismay, did reclaim the throne in 1705 and ruled until 1711 when he was killed and ruled until 1711 when he was killed by mutinous soldiers. I mean, they did kind of warn him. Next up, we have Joanna Castile, the former queen of Castile and Aragon, also known as as Joanna the Mad. She came into power in Castile in 1504 and gained control of Aragon in 1516, the union of which led to the evolution of modern day Spain. On October 20th of 1496, Joanna had married Philip I of Burgundy, son of the Holy Roman Empire. When Joanna first stepped into the throne in 1504, all seemed well. When Joanna first stepped into the throne in 1504, all seemed well. It wasn't until around two years later when it appeared she began to unravel. You see, Joanna, who had six children by Philip loved her husband. In fact, she loved him so much that when he died in the year 1506, she couldn't bear the idea of living without him by her side. And so she figured out a way to avoid having to. After his death, Joanna had Philip embalmed and then ordered him to be kept with her at all times. She refused to be separated from her late husband, keeping him in her room, sleeping next to him, and even taking him along on long journeys. All of this strange behavior led royal family members as well as the public to declare Joanna unfit to rule, and so her and Philip's son Charles eventually took on the role of regent, allowing his mother to live out her days with her deceased husband and taking on the role of the true leader of Spain. And finally to finish us off today we have Mustafa, the first former Sultan of the Ottoman Empire, which in its heyday stretched from the Balkans in southeastern Europe all the way to Anatolia, Central Asia, Arabia, and North Africa. In 1603 Mustafa's older brother Ahmed claimed the throne at the young age of 13. In accordance with Ottoman culture at the time, Ahmed was told to execute his brother so that Mustafa may never attempt to take the throne out from under him. Luckily, or unluckily, I'm not really sure, Ahmed refused to take the life of his brother, but instead locked him in a windowless prison cell until Ahmed eventually passed away, at which time Mustafa was forced to step up and assume the throne. Unfortunately, however, by this point in time, after having spent many years in maddening solitude, Mustafa was in no way fit to rule, and was soon replaced by his nephew, Osman. When Osman passed shortly after his coronation, Mustafa was once again instated as ruler. This time, however, he refused to leave his cage and so he had to be physically removed and placed on the throne. Mustafa spent his second rule feverishly scouring the castle for Osman, believing the former king to still be alive and begging him to come back to the throne. Eventually, this became too much for the people to handle and once again Mustafa was removed from his position of power and sent back to his prison where he later died of a seizure due to madness in 1690. Three. Starting with trick number 10, Queen Caroline, the clothed bather. So I'm not gonna lie, like 80% of this list is gonna be bath specific because for some reason, royals got really weird with that. When Caroline arrived in England as Princess of Wales in 1714, she amazed the court with her regular bathing habits. She liked her skin and gowns to be clean and her servants well manicured, a completely unheard of requirement in the time. What can I say? In the 17th century, bathing was controversial. There was two sides to the debate. One that said that bathing was healthy 
healthy and the other that argued it could damage your health, except in the most carefully prescribed circumstances. Now, her frequent bathing isn't subject of this section per se, because we don't perceive that as uncommon today. The commentary is actually going to be how on Caroline would bathe with clothing on. Not like those big old elaborate ball gowns, but in like a boxy slip, yeah. Wet but fully clothed, she would have been dunked with warm water, rubbed with flannel cloths, and treated with soap solutions and cosmetic preparations like may do, or the milk of asses and mares. Which is a lovely little segue into milk baths, number 9. You may think I'm about to spew off some Cleopatra facts and stories, which is fair, she and the Empress Papapea did make this treatment famous, but I'm talking about a different monarch and one funky decision she'd make after the bath. So milk baths use lactic acid, a alpha hydroxy acid to dissolve the proteins which hold together dead skin cells. Whether or not the ancients knew all that, they could tell it had a rejuvenating effect on their skin. Whenever she was suffering from a distressing malady, which is old in terms for a woman being upset, Countess Platten Hanover bathed in milk and then generously donated the contaminated milk to the poor. Lives of Queen of England, The House of Hanover, Volume 1 by Dr. John Dunn documented one such occasion, writing, Whenever Countess von Platten designed to appear with more ordinary brilliance than her own person, she was accustomed to indulge in an extravagant luxury of a milk bath, and it was added by the satirical or the scandalous that the milk which had just lent softness to her skin was charitably distributed amongst the poor of the district wherein she occasionally affected to play the character of Dorcas from the Bible. Now to answer the age old question, why toilets are called thrones is number 8. So French King Louis was downright gnarly. If he was alive now, the dude would probably be one of those people that's part of like that no shoes movement and refuses to wear deodorant and just terrorizes Walmart with how they smell. He famously made Versailles so bad, it smells to this day. And apparently he only bathed three times in his entire life, which should probably be punishable by death, because I can't imagine someone who has literally never bathed not smelling offensive. Apparently he changes clothes three times a day and had a new perfume made every week to help, but this gross little weasel really went the full mile. He had a toilet seat under his throne and he would use it while addressing the court. Imagine dying of boredom during the king's mandate and all of a sudden he starts making faces and pausing in sentences and clinging to the throne arms trying to force out that day's dinner. Imagine accidentally making eye contact. I think I'm done with this segment now. Number 7. Catherine de Medici Serving as the Queen of France from 1547 to 1559, Catherine de Medici had enormous political sway over her sons, the French kings Francis II, Charles IX, and Henry III. They reigned through the French wars of religion and faced problems with a group of Calvinist Protestants called the Huguenots. It is wildly believed by historians that de Medici attempted to have their leader, Gaspard II, de Colony assassinated. The attempt failed, and fearing retaliation from the most powerful Huguenots, de Messi planned to slay them all before they could take action. The result was that St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre, which resulted in the passing of between 5,000 and 30,000 Huguenots. Number 6. Lady Elizabeth Bathory Born in 1560 on a family estate in Royal Hungary, Elizabeth Bathory was of noble lineage and privilege with education, wealth, and a lofty social ranking. Her first taste of the morbidly bizarre was introduced to her during the early years of her life, when she suffered seizures, which may have been epilepsy. The treatment for such bouts included feeding the patient human remains and bits of skull from a non-sufferer. Yummy. She bore witness to brutal punishments and executions carried out by her father, officers, and was influenced by family members involved with Satanism and witchcraft. The fun stuff. When she was barely in the double digits of A's, Elizabeth was engaged to Count Fernek Nadesty, thank you, who she later married. Her husband spent much of the time away from home fighting the Ottomans, leaving Elizabeth to run the estate. Her Satanism became more pronounced as time wore on. Upon the passing of her husband in 1601, her vicious crimes escalated. Most of her victims were girls around the age around the age of the time that she got married, and were usually the daughters of lesser gentry who sent their daughters to court to learn etiquette. Her favorite punishment methods included using pins to stick under the victim's nails and covering her victims in honey to leave them out and be eaten by ants and other insects. She is really just great. Other methods included whipping her victims with nettles and frequently burning people, especially the downstairs bits. After burning her victims, she would even dump them in icy water. Many of her victims were punished to the point of passing and some of whom were buried in unmarked locations. Some sources claim she engaged in people munching, making her one of the darkest people in history. Elizabeth and a few of her servants were eventually arrested in 1610 and her accomplices were put to trial the next year. With over 300 witnesses and numerous testimonials, a guilty verdict was assured. A servant girl who claimed to have
have seen evidence in Elizabeth's private books stated that her victims numbered into the 600s. The accomplices were sentenced to be slain and she was confined to a bricked up room with slits for air and the delivery of food. She was found deceased a few years later. Number 5. Marie Antoinette France's queen between 1774 and 1792 was Marie Antoinette, who was the last queen before the French Revolution. Marie Antoinette had quite a reputation for splurging on expensive things and found herself in many scandals. One such scandal was the affair of the diamond necklace, which sounds like a Pink Panther movie. Countess de la Motte, a young lady, pretended to be the queen's friend and entered the French court in 1785. She fooled a high society member into believing that Antoinette loved him. She even hired a body selling worker and disguised her as the queen and convinced the man that Antoinette wanted to purchase a diamond necklace. The jewelry cost 1.6 million livres, which is basically like 12 million dollars today. The money was never paid and the queen had no clue about what had taken place. Although Antoinette was innocent, the public despised her. Granted, she is mostly known for her infamous dialogue. When the French subjects could not afford bread, she said let them eat cake, which fueled the French Revolution and it ultimately led to her being executed. Number 4. Queen of Castile Joanna La Loca was the Queen of Castile from 1504 to 1516 and she suffered from various mental disorders. After her husband passed away in 1506, her father buried his body. However, Joanna used to open the tomb and caress her husband. <laughs> ultimately, she ordered the body to be dug out and, you know, she kept doing stuff to it. I'm not going to get into it. It's a little graphic. Additionally, she would carry his coffin everywhere with her and actually kept him under her bed for quite some time. Years later, she allowed his burial outside of her window. Honestly, I just, uh, I just, it's so creepy. Why would you do that to a body? Number three, Maria Eleanor of Brandenburg. Maria Eleonora of Brandenburg, born on November 11th in 1599 and passed away on March 28th, 1655. That's right, she made it quite a while. She held the title of Queen of Sweden from 1620 to 1632 as the wife of King Gustav II Adolf. Coming from a noble German family, she belonged to the prestigious House of Hohenzollern, and I'm definitely going to mispronounce that. However, when Maria and Gustav gave birth to a girl with a genetic condition causing excessive hair growth, Maria was deeply shocked. The unexpected the appearance of her daughter combined with societal beauty expectations really pushed Maria to her limits. She considered her daughter ugly and refused to care for what she perceived as a monstrous creature. When Gustav passed away when Christina was only seven, Maria blamed her for his passing. For a year, Maria subjected Christina to harsh punishment, confined her to blacking out, darkened rooms to mourn her father in solitude for extended periods, even placing Gustav's open casket into Christina's room and demanding that she sleep next to it. That's way too much. Morbid even by my standards. Good lord. Number two, Sissy the Dragon Lady. The story of Sissy's rise to power is a remarkable one. Born at a time when Chinese women were politically invisible, Sissy managed to acquire enormous political influence by exploiting her position as a royal concubine, engaging in court intrigues and manipulating those around her. By the end of the 1860s, Sissy had become the most powerful individual in China. Her will and her reach even exceeded two male emperors who she frequently bypassed or overruled. Sissy was born Lan Qu in 1835, the daughter of a minor Manchu official, and at age 15 she was selected as a potential concubine for the emperor and relocated to the Forbidden City. She was elevated to the status of concubine by 18 and eventually gave birth to the emperor's only son, Zhe Chun a feat that earned her another promotion in the palace's hierarchy. Yes, sir. The emperor passed away in 1861, shortly after the disastrous Second Opium War, and left the throne to his only son. As the mother of the reigning emperor, Sissy was given the courtesy title Duwagar Empress. By this point, Sissy had become adept at manipulation, palace intrigues, and power games. Through forged evidence and false testimony, she engineered the arrest of the eight ministries, three of whom were later executed. With the Regency Council gone, Sissy became the de facto regent for the duration of her son's range until his early passing from smallpox in 1875. Another rumor claims that 3,000 ebony boxes were needed to store her jewelry collection, so hey, she was a bit of a hoarder. And at number one, Agrippina the Younger. Julia Agrippina, also referred to as Agrippina the Younger, was Roman Empress from 49 to 54 AD, the fourth wife and niece of Emperor Claudius, and the mother of Nero. After the death of her first husband, Agrippina tried to make shameless advances 
to the future Emperor Galba, who showed no interest in her and was devoted to his wife Amelie Lepida. On one occasion, Galba's mother-in-law gave Agrippina a public reprimand and a slap in the face before a whole bevy of married women. Agrippina was one of the most prominent women in Julio-Claudian dynasty, functioning as the behind-the-scenes advisor in the affairs of the Roman state via powerful political ties. She maneuvered her son Nero into the line of succession. Claudius became aware of her plotting, but passed away in 54, and it was rumored that Agrippina poisoned him. Agrippina exerted a commanding influence in the early years of Nero's reign, but in 59 she was slain. Both ancient and modern sources describe Agrippina's personality as ruthless, ambitious, violent, and domineering. Yeah.